Good, good morning, colleagues. A wonderful good morning to all of us. I see that some of us look very tired. I, I just hope that we rested well and that we enjoyed our gala dinner of uh, yesterday and now ready to get going with the business of, of the day. I know that we are running quite late and today is the final day of our very interesting and informative program and I also know that some of our distinguished participants of this conference are to fly out around noon time, so we don't have much time. And some of them are on the panels and they must present papers. So I think it's only appropriate that we start now. I, you can see that the dedicated MC of the program is not here, but we'll start. And they'll find us on the way. Uh, the first intervention we have for this morning Okay. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I hope you had a wonderful evening and you rested well. Sincere apologies that you had to start late, but we are going to start. And I hope by the time that the young ones come in, they will get the message that, you know, if we are going to be this late, the bus is going to leave us behind. And business, time is money. So we'll get started. My presentation is going to, is entitled Identifying Opportunities to Maximize Benefits of Namibian Local Content. Now, were you all here last night during the gala dinner? Okay, if you heard Dr. Hangala's uh, statement last night, one of the things he was actually trying to highlight was how we can really drive our economy, make sure that we see even this Ludres become a minute Israel with the greenery everywhere, or Dubai. So I'm happy that as a first speaker today, Ludres is trying to demonstrate that I'm surrounded by a bit of greeneries in front of me here, beautiful greeneries. Secondly, when you're talking about innovation as well, maybe some of you saw me as I was trying to flip my laptop. I've had this laptop for one year and only discovered a few minutes ago that actually I can afford it. So we have young talent here that is also very innovative and can actually get us there. So on that note, I'll start with my presentation. I hope I can go through it as soon as possible. Oh, okay. Somebody tell me how do I do this gadget? Is it on? Can we have the presentation on, please? Technical team? Are we having a technical freeze or what? <laughs> Can I get a signal? I want to believe that probably the media is already actually on. Uh, okay, there we are. So how do I do this? this? This buttons that I move. Huh? How do I move? Is this the arrows that I'm moving? I don't know if it's on. Okay, looks like. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Somebody have to do that later. So, just a big background on the basis of the local content, particularly in this industry that we are really focused on this morning. Um, statistical analysis show that there is limited relationship between the performance of the mining sector and the outcomes of other sectors that represent fundamentals of the, our local economy. So this indicates that there are limited benefits that are derived from the mining sector. I know that my, my president is also making the headlines to these papers, but this is the reality. So, there is weak economic leakages among industries, an indication that the value chain of most economic activities, including mining, have limited local content. We heard yesterday, even from Dr. Angala's statement, that so when we're looking at local content, we should look at it in the broader perspective, not only in this sector, but also other sectors of the economy. Now, when there is actually no or low local content, that means that the economy is highly exposed to external shocks as a result. And as you can see also from the statistics here, in terms of timeless trends on our GDP growth, it confirms that the relationship between the global and South African economic growth on our local economy. I'm just, I thought I was. Sorry. So you can see the trends there from 1990 with all the other, you know, global, um, you know, happenings, whether it's from the political crisis in, I, in, in SA, the Asian financial crisis, the global commodity boom, as you go. As a result of limited local content within the Namibian context, of course, our GDP gets actually to be highly affected there. In the mining industry itself, out of the headline industry revenue of about 35 billion, about 14 billion or 40% is spent on, out, on inputs, of which more than half of these inputs expenditures are imported. And that is when we actually net out the expenditure on water and um, electricity or utility supplies. Now let's look at the local industry now, the, 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 or the oil and gas industry. It's important to understand that this sector actually is divided into three major components. I know that unfortunately we could not have somebody from Namco probably that would have given us actually more details of this content, but I'll try my best using as much as possible layman's language here. So you have the upstream, which actually involves the searching for and recovery and production of crude oil and natural gas which is also known as Exploration and Production, or ENP. And this includes searching for potential underground or underwater oil and gas fields, drilling of exploration wells, and subsequently operating the wells that recover and bring the crude oil or raw natural gas on the surface production. Then you have the upstream, uh, sorry, the midstream. So midstream operations are usually included in the downstream, category, and midstream is all about taking the crude oil retrieved in the upstream sector and getting it to the downstream processing facilities so that it can be turned into the various finished products in consumers' daily lives. Then we come to the downstream, which is all about converting the oil and the gas, natural gas resources into the fuels and finished products that we actually use, which will be the lubricants, the jet fuels, the pesticides, pharmaceuticals, natural gas, propane, etc. Now let's look at the value chain within the oil and gas industry. Okay. So the value chains begins with exploration and site developments. The process then followed by drilling, extraction of the resources, and production of the products, including crude oil. The products are then shipped to storage facilities before they are refined to retail products such as fuel. So just the preparation of actually the, actually the, the sites there, obviously we can already see the value chains in there. All right. 
Then on the, in the upstream sector, this involves three value chains procedures, namely the discovery, which is identifying the sites of the mining operations, evaluations of certain amount of reserves, and then development to establish the required infrastructure facilities as well as production of the intermediate products. So obviously, in all that, you know that there are also opportunities actually in the value chains there, in the preparatory stage of the upstream sector. Also at the stage of production, heavy investment, that's a sunk, sunk costs, are incurred to confirm availability of the resource. Sampling and commercial availability of the resource, the required human capital actually increases within, this sub, within the subsequent stages um, of, 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 of the upstream sector. This means you require more labor operations and, and move towards the production of, uh, of the exploration. So we come now to the downstream sector. So this is now the transportation and storage process of the oil and gas value chain, which involves transferring the intermediate products from the production wells to the storage facilities before they're exported to the refinery facilities. Um, it's a pity, I know probably my colleague, uh, Mr. Knowledge Kati, I know they have, uh, they, uh, he will actually be able to highlight more in terms of the, you know, that sector within the, the downstream sector, what the challenges really are currently. Okay. Um, however, am I having the correct presentation here? <laughs> all right. Then after all the oil has actually been, you know, done, we've found all of this, we've made the money and all of everybody has made their money and then they will tell you the lifespan of this drill is only about 50 years or 100 years, what happens next? The decommissioning, ensuring that our environment is actually not spoiled. Obviously also, this is also another value chain where we actually require locals to actually participate in terms of the decommissioning of the actual of the project. Okay, now yesterday you heard a lot, I think even in the beginning of the first, uh, the first session, um, lawyer Shikongo spoke a lot, giving examples on how other countries that have also you not know, discovered oils are actually doing. A specific example when it comes to Guyana. The Guyana Local Content Act of 8, 18 of 2021 has specified services and sectors that would specifically be reserved for Guyana nationals or Guyanese companies. And some of these sectors, as you can see, for example, for the rental of office space, 90% of Guyanese companies or Guyanese nationals. Accommodation services, equipment rental, surveying, pipe welding. I'm sure the list is clear. You can all see it, right? So these are some of the services that you can actually see. That was actually deliberately divided and the percentage of that for locals, that is actually reserved. Now, Minister Alwenda, when he was here yesterday, he also indicated and mentioned on the local content. This is one appeal that we want to make to you as the private sector. When consultations are happening in two political, I mean, policy inputs, we require you to participate. Um, today, we are faced with a lot of laws that were made where we're not here, particularly when you see some of our mining sectors. The NAMDEP is a specific case. We are not there when the agreements were being signed. But this new resource, we are here. And we need to make sure that we get specifically involved in really making sure that we also give our inputs. And the decisions that we make today, anything that we put in black and white, does not work against us in the coming years. So Dr. Angala also made mention that not just local content, but there's really need to be a legislative framework to ensure that, you know, we, we, we really have a legislative framework that actually guides this industry and how the investors are required to also perform when they come. What is it that we want to see as Namibians as well? So we will start with the consultations of this local content policy and we want to make sure that you also give your inputs. By the way, by a show of hands, how many of you have seen the draft local content policy? So very few, just keep raising your hands, keep your raising your hands, keep your raising your hands. And those that are raising your hands, how many of you are in the private sector? So it's all of you, so very few. Okay, by a show of hands, how many of you are from the private sector in this room? 
So those that did not raise their hands when I asked about the local content policy, it's because you are not NCCI members. So just make sure, please, after this, you sign up because it's important that you get this information. Irrespective, I'm not going to charge you. Just please make sure that when we start with the consultations, please read, get into the details. Young people, young Namibians that are lawyers, we need your skills. This is the time that you must shine. Pro bono, come and give your inputs and guide us. If you look at Guyana's policy, content, local content policy, we will share it. It's in layman's language. Even a secondary school learner will be able to understand it. So we don't want you to complicate us with so much legal jargon. Just make it as simple, as simplified as possible for every Namibian to understand it and know what is actually in it for them. I think I deserve a round of applause on that one. You're too quiet. Thank you. So I have said that participation of the private sector, very, very critical. We need to make sure that the inputs, the submissions we give to the minister is coming from all of us here. So we also need our media partners. It's not very easy to reach through us, the entire Namibia for us, with the little resources that we have, particularly as a chamber. But we could actually, you know, work together as partners. For example, when you have consultations anywhere, let's have the live broadcast so that Namibians, everybody, everywhere can participate and give their inputs. Now, also it's very important that even after we got the announcements, whatever, we have to understand that this industry alone is not the only child, it's not the only economic child in the Namibian house. It will form part of the broader family of the Namibian economic, of the Namibia economic family. So, of course, it represents opportunities in terms of revenue generation and support to other industries. It is said that, you know, we might be getting almost 100 billions. So what does that mean, not only to the Tsumeb community, what does that mean to every Namibian? Okay? Employment creation, skills development, as well as indicated, and economic diversification. But then there must be targeted approach in their procurement system, prioritization of partnerships with experienced companies in order to maximize knowledge and transfer. Yes, we can do it alone, it's a new industry, but of course, what is required is make sure that that skills actually transfer to Namibians. Now, off track, just a little bit of that. Recently, I was part of the team that's under the National Planning Commission that undertook a benchmarking study to South Korea as we prepare our NDP-6. Obviously, we need there are consultations within the NDP-6 as well, and we need to make sure that we prioritize some of these. So what happened? How many of you have been to South Korea? Okay, I'm the only one. All right, good. How many of you have read about the economic miracle of South Korea? Very few again. So now, this is what happened. South Korea, many of you knew that, you know, in the 50s, earlier, they went through war with Japan. Poverty levels were unprecedented and unseen. They all had the same similar challenges as in Africa. So what did they do? The first phase of its economic development, of course, was under military rule, where they made sure that every land that was occupied by the Japanese was taken and given to the private sector to make sure that they can start to be productive. South Korea's step of food then was rice. They started growing the rice to make sure that first they start with poverty elevation. From there on, the first priority they did was to really invest into their education. They educated their citizens from the old, old literacy levels, from the old age, was up to almost by actually over 90%. Education and training was invested. Then they started developing their economies from the rice where they made a lot of, um, I, mean, I mean, they addressed the poverty issue, but then they discovered that you know, the rice, that the variety that they had then was, also had seasonal challenges. So they invested into research and development. They started growing other varieties of rice that they started exporting to other economies. And in there, they could actually start supporting other industries, where they started with industrialization, manufacturing. Today, South Korea is actually one of the Asian tigers. I think the level of growth, economic growth, has ne almost not seen in any country in the world. In a period of only 40 years, this is not Photoshop. You know, what is very amazing with South Korea is that you know, their land is very small. 
I think almost seven times smaller than Namibia's land. Out of that, many of that also is also very mountainous. They have not disturbed the ecosystem, the way they are building the infrastructure. When you have mountains wherever you are as a Namibian, you are able to see through everything and they make sure they planted trees, planted you know, vegetation everywhere. There's no North Korean, South Koreans that want to leave their country to go anywhere because I think they have their heaven on earth. What did it take for South Korea to do that? As I indicated, they had to make sure that they have a skilled workforce, whether it's into vocational, technology, and all of that. They did that. Then export-oriented industrialization was key for them to actually bring foreign currency and make sure that they can support other industries. Then government support and policies, clear intervention. There was very clear who's supposed to be doing what, at but what particular time and responsibilities and accountability, very, very clear. Then there was also the growth of entrepreneurship. Today we should not shy away to be seeing the Maria and Dubu group of companies, the Knowledge Pinga group of companies, the Charity Mayor group of companies. It must happen. And it has requires government support. Where we are now, I saw somebody when they saw a picture of someone who was seated, you know, with the Westerners, they say, no, he's a sellout. And one young Namibian said, what is there to sell? You don't own the land, you don't own the fish, you don't own the mines, you don't own nothing as Namibians, so what is there to sell? So it's really a time as Namibians that we have to be very serious in terms of how are we prepared to make sure that with this oil boom, how are we going to make sure that we actually, you know, support other industries? Now, for Ludris as an example, it does not only mean the private sector, but even institutional capacity. This is a time that you have to look at the people that are supposed in the public service that are economic drivers. Imagine 100 billion, and for a local authority like Ludris, that has never actually been able to have 1 billion. What are they going to do with 1 billion? So you need to have serious people that are going to be talking about, don't let people bring serious loose infrastructure here. I spoke yesterday of ours and Ludris becoming only one city. What does it mean? Invest in infrastructure where you have, you know, sophisticated as North Korea, China, the subway, whereby a young Namibian living in ours is able to commute to Ludris within five minutes and back and they can build their mansion in ours. As a matter of fact, you don't have much land in Lodris, so you need more land actually in us. As we were driving, <laughs> thank you. As we were driving, every time I drive to Lodris, there's something, and we must call a spade a spade. Every part of Namibia that I drive to, if you drive, you pay attention to that. It's, it's, it's private land. And that private land really starts from where the main road starts. You see it's visible in your eyes. Is this the strain that you want actually to maintain in the coming years? No. We want to make sure that we know very well that as Namibians, we have, this is what we want. The oil money is coming. What are we going to do? Are we going to still to afford to have this kind of classrooms? The ones that you are seeing there is not a hotel. It's a primary school in one of the oil producing countries. So there must be deliberate interventions where we say, when with this boom, so much must go into education and the average or the standard of an average primary school in Namibia must look like this. And not like this, but like that. This is what we should be pushing at. So when people make comparisons, when results come out and say, yo, St. Paul's child is the best performing are from who, 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 and you talk about a child that is at Kachinakachi or Tsesabis that has to walk five kilometers to the nearest school. When they get there, they are sweating, no ventilation, they have not even eaten. You expect that child to perform. So in as much as we are talking here, us as this generation, the next 50, 60 years, we are not there. But what are we doing to the Namibian child? Make sure that you invest in the right education for the Namibian child. That place on the left side is in Namibia. This place on the left side, can you guess where this is? Anybody here to guess? Huh? Yeah, explore your country. This is around Divundu. It's, there's a river. There's a river there. 
Why should Divundu look like that? One of the oil producing countries, it was literally a desert. This is how it looks. In the next 15, 20 years, Divundu must look like rats. We can do it. And this is the kind of investment that we are talking about. With that oil money, it must be very deliberate to say, let's have Divundu turn into a, one of our best agricultural research centers, research and development, our vocational education as well, vocational schools, you name them, they must be of the particular standard. And as I indicated, you see here, it's a shared responsibility from all of us. All of us from government, it's a time that Namibia, if there's any time in Namibia to be a leader is now. Because you are the people that are going to now drive the destiny of this country. Okay, so we are saying now, with this local content conference, as NCCI, our commitment now as a start point is to establish a database of our vendors to promote accessibility of local businesses with industry operators and international service providers. What we don't want to do is also to compromise. Yesterday, somebody was talking about, you know, the entries of, for example, catering. Some of these oil companies have particular standards that they want you to meet. If you're going to be operating there, they don't want to hear that some of their staff, while well, they're offshore, whatever, you know, they had food poisoning or the food, whatever. There are standards that have to be met. And we need to prepare also our locals for those kind of things. The procurements that is coming from these companies also that are coming to operate here, it must make sure that it confirmed also to the locals that we are able and are prepared also to be able to conform to their procurement standards. And then obviously, we have to watch out these risks also when it comes to these local content issues. Then you will have people that will come with their flashy business cards telling you that you know, they are the experts in all of this, but you have to be careful. And that is why we want to make sure that as a chamber, the process with streamlines with the relevant institutions that are already there not creating institutions, somebody must come, not come from somewhere and tell us, no, we want to form a chamber of oil and whatever here. We already have an a chamber here. Bring the expertise within NCCI and we produce that. Make sure it's local content. That's what we are saying. <laughs> so, from my side, I think I have said, oil is just part one of the child, the economic chart within the Namibian economy. But we must use this opportunity. If it's going to address our budget deficit there, then we should be thinking more broader. It's not for us just to think that, hey, am I just going to be a supply and whatever. Let's start thinking more broader. What comes with this industry wherever we are? You will have oil, you're not going to eat oil. It means we need to invest in our green schemes, invest in food production, so that we have actually a health nation that's self-sufficient. We must improve in, 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 uh, in the industrial, what is this? Industrial Revolution, AR or whatever. The young people there were telling me now when they were laughing about my laptop here. Um, the young girl lady here who's a doctor, she was already telling us now how even in the health sector they are going with this technology. She doesn't need to be there physically. She can be able to diagnose you while you are on sea. And these are actually happening already in other countries. This is where we should be looking as a nation. Ludris, if we look at the history of Ludris, you go there's that old town that started when there were only less than a thousand people to where it is today. It's a history that we need to be able to develop. The place where we are now, it was an old thing. We have transformed it. We have not really completely destroyed what is there as history. But then as we go on as whatever Ludris has to be, can we also try to project how we want to see Ludris to be in the next 20 years? It cannot continue to just be a desert. I went also to, Indone I mean to, to Indonesia. Indonesia, there was a young biologist. They had serious problems with marine pollution. And the young biologist in the Indonesia University found a solution to address the marine pollution. So he was able to actually convert all the waste into biodegradable plastics. So they had to grow cassava. Using the cassava starch, they're able to produce biodegradable plastics. Cassava grows even in the desert. There's an opportunity. Just get the rice seedlings, you see all the greenery and everything, whatever else, and you're able to bring, even producing ethanol. The Chinese in Zambia have served almost 100,000 farmers with cassava, where they are now actually exporting ethanol to DRC. They're producing it locally. 
So these are some of the opportunities that you'd be looking at, that the money that is coming from the oil, don't just be thinking of actually going into the oil and whatever, but what is this industry actually bringing in terms of supporting all the other industries that you're looking at? With that, I think I thank you. Now, I don't know how I have missed my email address there, but I will put it. We have you on your database. I have spoken about a database that the chamber is going to be embarking on. Very, very important that we start getting you on board so that we prepare you for the kind of training capacity that, and the skills that you require to do. Because these companies are already now starting to ask who are the SMEs in this particular sector and so forth, so that we can catch the threat preparing and capacity to you as much as possible. Importantly, share the information. In this industry, in this time, it's not a solo kind of you know, approach. We have to move together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for that call on Namibian businesses to take this opportunity seriously and to run with it. It requires hard work. We shall move on to our next session without uh, wasting time. And I will ask the moderator of the session, uh, Eckhart Friedrich, to come and uh, direct the panel discussion. Friedrich. Good morning. Um, morning. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Nguye, for a very insightful presentation. Um, we, we hope we can still add to that. Um, but uh, can I please call my esteemed panelists to the stage, Mr. Luis Cavallo and uh, Mr. Knowledge Ipinge. So um, I think uh, we'll give our panelists uh, a chance to introduce themselves briefly before we dive right in. Um, hi, good morning everyone. Thanks for the ones that made it. Uh, it seems it was difficult to get here this morning. But uh, yeah, my name is Luis Lago de Carvalho. I'm here representing the Service Providers Association of Angola, as well as my own company, which we are already looking at as Namibian market. Yeah, that's it. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Knowledge Ipinge. Um, I'm a shareholder in Operatech Maritime and Industrial Training College. Um, and I'm here just to share insights definitely from a service company perspective. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so this is... So this can actually be a quite exciting discussion. So Angola has been through the oil and gas industry for, for quite some time. So very happy to, to have Luis here. And uh, Knowledge is um, setting up the same for Namibia. We're in the, in the starting blocks here. So um, we hope to, to really be able to compare some good notes here and, and learn from what has done, been done in the past. So, um, what are some of the key opportunities for maximizing uh, Namibian local talent? Let's start with a broad question like that. Um, so, Luis, uh, perhaps over to you. I think, uh, just as, uh, as a starting point, I think Namibia uh, is in a very, it's in a, a very good place compared to other geographies to actually take advantage of this. Uh, you might not think of that because normally we tend to compare with countries which are a lot more advanced, but uh, I know a lot of the African reality, and let me tell you that you guys are a lot more well equipped to develop the local talent and the local companies because of the base, the base structure you already have. Um, I see a lot of people complaining about the infrastructure, but let me tell you, you've got a lot more 
infrastructure than a lot of countries, including ours, which we've been in the oil and gas business for many years. Um, your actual standard curriculum is very good. Uh, when you talk about having skills, I think you already have a very good basis. And I speak to people that moved here for that specific reason. Uh, you have immediately one thing, you already speak English. So that makes a big difference in the oil and gas uh, uh, business. Uh, what I think you need is just to adapt what you have, most of what you have, uh, to the standards required. So I think you, Namibia is in a very good position. And there's one point I've been raising you have a very small population for the amount of money that's coming in. So if it's well managed, you can do a lot. So then knowledge, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, um, I believe looking at Luderet specifically and Wolfish Bay, um, I believe um, that we are blessed by the fact that we had um, the fishing industry, which is a perfect case study, and uh, the maritime industry itself, of which we have companies who have established themselves um, already and who are ready to also provide services um, to the oil and gas industry. Looking at um, entities such as um, LSS um, in the logistics space, Wesco in terms of waste management, and then engineering companies, fabrication companies, and so on, which are all actually around the value chain around the oil and gas industry. So we have that foundation actually laid already, and it will be easier for us to then transition also into service companies within the oil and gas industry. And just to add to that, we have an entity like NEMDOC, of which 70% of NEMDOC um, clients are actually oil and gas um, companies. So that foundation is laid already. So we already got so far and looking at services such as subsea services, which Luis provides and so on, NEMDOC has actually uh, produced a lot of divers, um, underwater welders and so on, who actually already give us that base that we need. Okay, so, so I think we've established that there's, there's already a good base here. So for, for companies already operational, um, how is the oil and gas industry different? Um, so if you want to get into the game, what are the specific things you need to be doing now to, to get ready to participate? I would say the main, the main thing you need to, the companies need to start looking at is certifications, level of certification and training. Uh, the training sometimes is not, the, the, most of the people are trained let, let me give you an example, Mar the marine sector. Uh, you have one here with, because of the fisheries. You have deck hands, you have everything. The only thing you need to do is, and someone mentioned yesterday uh, about this, you need to do the conversion. And uh, it's not a difficult process, it might be a bit expensive, because unfortunately our, is, our industry is a bit more expensive, so the certificates are, are quite expensive. But all you need to do is that. Um, Get the, the, for example, even a dry dock for a, a standard fishing vessel, doesn't, you need to have a different standard and different set of certifications with different class, class societies to be able to take on uh, oil field uh, support vessels. So that's, that, I would say that's the main, the main basis and you need to look at that. Um, don't just open training centers and put courses on universities unless they have the final certification, the final degree that is required for the oil and gas industry. Thank you. Um, so, so knowledge, what is being done by Namibians at this point in time to, to get those qualifications, that training in place? Um, can you maybe give us a few pointers there? Yeah, um, like Luis mentioned, definitely certification is the most important part. And ourselves, actually, um, as OMIT in Namibia, we've embarked on that journey since last year, March. So um, as a first step, what we have done, definitely, um, we actually um, crowd pulled um, resources locally, of which we definitely look at um, skills in terms of individuals who have um, experience within the oil and gas industry, who have worked on oil platforms um, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, and so on. We onboarded them as part of the team, definitely, just to add um, a strong basis and for us to also have um, a foundation to negotiate from. Um, why we did that, it was deliberate because we then realized setting up this institution is really capital intensive. 
and because of us approaching then commercial banks and all that, it became difficult for us to raise the amount of money that we required. So we then had to look outside the borders and started speaking to different institutions, of which we then um, successfully managed to get into an agreement um, with the entity in Angola, of which um, we pushed through actually a very unique clause within our agreement. And this clause actually is based on the capital investment that was actually done um, from Angola, of which currently um, the Angolan partners have majority shareholding within the company itself. But then uh, the clause actually provides, in terms of the IP that we bring on board as Namibians, um, for an automatic um, transfer of shareholding to a 51, 49% upper, at the time that the uh, investor recoup their investment. So that's a clause that we deliberately put into that clause that's speaking actually to local content. And then also looking at then um, what we require, we then um, know the situation of which most companies currently, I believe we have a lot of service companies here, getting contracts, uh, they are compelled definitely to either have uh, someone with a Boziet certification, UET certification, which currently the closest you can get that is in South Africa in Saldana Bay or in Cape Town. So deliberately we then embark on the journey to say, why can we not have a Namibian institution then who is OPITO accredited? And we then started that process um, with a desktop submission and all that. I was fortunate to uh, be invited to the global conference last year in Malaysia of OPITO, of which I presented also a Namibian case in that regard. And we currently have a forum coming up on the 21st um, of April in Cape Town for Africa and the Middle East, of which we will then be having actually uh, the accreditation process reviewed for Namibia. And that institution, we've started setting it up in Wolfish Bay. What we did del uh, deliberately also as part of that, uh, we have 90% uh, Namibian youth employed, um, of which all these 90% employees we sent to Angola for a period of about um, two months, of which they then went for on-the-job training within Angola itself. We then also then embarked on an apprenticeship program for, um, for junior instructors who we then busy upskilling actually to take up positions. Because um, starting, we will be forced to start with expatriates, but then um, after a period of about two years when our junior instructors are ready, they will then be able to fill up those positions. So intentionally, we are ticking off the boxes within the local content policy itself already. And um, this is one of the pre-requests of most um, operators. And with OPITO, the standards being very high. And also, um, one thing I want to also maybe just to add to, to Ms. Moya's um, presentation, the vendor um, database that, uh, that is being developed. I believe we should also look at um, setting up a criteria for the companies especially looking at the ISO certifications and all these that um, most of the, uh, what is it, operators require and the industry itself requires as well. Excellent. There's lots more happening than I was aware of. So um, I, I hope you have enough business cards here, knowledge. To, there's a lot of young Namibians that will probably want to have a chat with you. No, definitely um, open. So if we look at... Um, you know, creating long-term value through this industry, um, creating sustainable wealth um, versus, you know, short-term um, uh, spiky income uh, generation. Um, do you have any ideas uh, what can be done now or what we need to, to think about putting in place to creating a sustainable uh, skills base, uh, source of wealth, etc.? I think, I think the, pres the presentation before us uh, replied to your question. Uh, I think there was several cases that were indicated where, where the money coming from the oil and gas could be spent and to develop the existing uh, businesses or to create new businesses. So at the end of the day, I think um, it's also a bit of the government, uh, what they want to do with, that, with, those, with those funds. Someone mentioned Dubai, uh, in, those, in, the, in the first day. Um, I like the model, I dislike some of the things of the model. I don't agree that someone just should get a check at the end of the day because the country is rich. You need to work for your money. But what they did with the funds, what they created around it, 
with tax, with tax reduction zones specifically for some types of businesses. I think that's one way. But um, you can develop a lot what you have uh, existing, what you existing have already in the country. Uh, let me give you an example. You are very well set to receive people. Uh, your tourism industry is one of the best in the region. Uh, so what you need is just to size scale it, scale it, and uh, get again. I will phrase this all the time, the right certification, the right uh, setup for the utilization of the oil and gas industry. So you already have, uh, I, I, I don't know in the region, apart from South Africa maybe, if there's any more, there's that many rental cars uh, than you have in Namibia. I think only South Africa has more car rentals than you guys have here. So that's already a big step because that will be a huge requirement. Companies do not buy their own cars, they will rent everything they will rent buses, but even those cars, you have to have a certain setup in the car to be able to contract to an oil and gas company or to an oil and gas service provider. So, but for a long-term, long-term uh, vision, yeah, I need the, the sustainable businesses is what you need to go after with using the money of the oil and gas to 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 build up. Uh, I think I see you already doing with the wind, with the solar which is a lot longer, but that doesn't, and let me be very blunt here, oil and gas business does not bring many jobs. I'm sorry to say that, people are not happy to hear it, but just to make, people do not get very hyped about thousands and thousands of jobs, because some countries do that mistake and then governments are constant, constantly pushed, why is there no more jobs? It's not a, it's not a, a workforce intensive uh, business, much less, the solar, the solar business uh, and the wind business. On the setup, yes, on the construction, which can be a boost, uh, but farming, uh, mining, those are the ones that still have a lot of, a lot of um, numbers, big numbers. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just to add to that, um, I believe one of the biggest mistakes we should actually avoid making is to abandon other sectors and only focus on the oil and gas industry or the energy sector itself. For example, looking at the fishing industry, we should not let go of that. It should actually be ongoing. And then the agricultural sector, which is very important, especially um, when looking at local content in terms of food supplies and all that. But we know definitely um, Namibia as a country, we're also not a manufacturing country. So we should start thinking industrialization, engineering industrialization. And this is one challenge we have in Namibia is the fact that we have good frameworks, we have good policies, but the implementation thereof remains a challenge. And when we're speaking of local content, um, we also forgetting at the same time that we have the growth at home um, industrial policy, for example. That actually speaks mostly the same thing, which is actually access to markets, um, value addition, as well as also um, development. So we need to look at local content also by integrating it also into the growth at home industrial policy and then uh, looking also at what the Ministry of Trade and Industry um, is busy with currently um, in terms of the special economic zones as well as also the investment and facilitation bill as well, which definitely speaks to what we actually trying to put together in terms of um, the local content policy itself. Um, at the same time, we should look at outdated laws like the Merchant Shipping Act, of which we know definitely NAMFI has been a victim of this, as to why they're not able to produce skilled workers for the fishing industry. It's because of the 1951 law, which needs to be amended. And at the same time, this law is also speaking to all the um, offshore platforms, whether it is the ships, um, the oil rigs, and all that. So if we are dictated by 1951 law in terms of that, then definitely we're not keeping up to speed with what's happening in current times. The other thing also is that um, we have our sea or our waters are very unique. Um, unique in a sense to say the Benguela current itself. So we have then standards developed, um, mainly looking at the North Sea, for example. But then the realities within our seas are not the same, and that's why you see during all these um, processes ongoing within our waters, there's been a lot of trial and error, a lot of changes in terms of the equipment they're using and so on. That actually puts us um, in a unique space to look into developing our standards, and we have institutions like the Namibia Standards Institution, 
which also need to play a leading role in this respect as well. Just wanted to add, yesterday on the presentation of the town expansion, there was a mention of a uh, factory for, it was in Tune, it was salmon, salmon factory. Yes. That's a good example. Uh, to add it, so added value to your existing uh, resources, um, we do the same mistake. We take everything from the land and we just export it. Uh, there's a change now with um, diamond cutting factories, with, but you, since you have a huge fa fishery industry, I think you need to, to do more on that. And the money can be spent with, on those, on training people for those areas that you can then develop new added value to your, to your natural resources. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, looking beyond sort of the domestic market, um, how do you think um, can policy makers and Namibian business collaborate uh, to explore international partnerships and export opportunities um, to further enhance local content? And um, looking at all the things that are happening around Luderitz with all the, the massive mega projects happening, um, do you see any, any synergies between what needs to happen here and uh, what we can leverage of other sectors? Okay, um, my personal approach, especially when it comes to local content, um, I've embarked on, what we, uh, on a pan-African approach. Why the pan-African approach definitely um, it's informed by factors such as um, um, capital, of which we know definitely with our commercial banks and all that, they're not ready yet for the industry itself. But um, due to historic um, relationships, for example, with Angola, we can then tap into um, investments within Angola itself. Um, with Luis, for example, here, he is in Namibia definitely looking for opportunities. So it provides definitely an opportunity for Namibians to organize themselves, get around the same table with him, and try to see how they can collaborate and then work together. Um, what we have then done deliberately last year, August, at the last uh, Namibian Oil and Gas um, Conference, we then um, entered into a MOU of which um, ICPA, which Luis uh, represents, as well as um, a, a service company association that we started in, um, in Wolfish Bay last year in order for us to be able to bridge that gap of which we're definitely sharing information, um, building um, a relationship just in terms of um, business referrals, um, looking definitely at um, research and development as well. So there are many areas that we still try to put, and that's just a foundation that we've laid of which service companies can then work together. So we need to create that conducive environment, especially for service companies to be able to coexist with each other. And sometimes it's a Namibian contractor that um, receives, um, uh, let's say, a purchase order from an operator, but uh, they don't have the capital. They can then speak, let's say, it's subsea services. So if I get that contract, definitely Luis is in subsea services, I can then reach out to him in terms for us to then go into a JV and then be able to do that together. So we should definitely look into such collaborations which genuinely also um, benefit Namibians long term. Yeah, I would say the, most of this, uh, being a local company as well, not in Namibia, but in Angola, uh, the, the local content issue has been very dear to us, uh, not only as a, as an, as a name, as a businessman, but also part of the, the association, we've, we're constantly trying to revise the law and change. But the first step and the easiest way for any company to get into the business is through the JVs, through partnering with uh, experienced international companies. Not everyone has a chance, and some of them are not successful. But we, for example, we, we, we were 15 years in partnership with an international company, we ended up buying the share and becoming a fully owned Angolan company, but, uh, and that's the benefit. And it's possible to do, like uh, Knowledge said, and George is a good example of that, the internationalization, after being capable of, 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 of overcoming all the, the obstacles. We, for example, we're not working here, but we, this year we, did, we already did the installation of, of an FPSO in Ivory Coast. So that shows you, uh, that, shows that it's possible for local companies to grow enough, and we're talking about that middle tier of the 20% that George mentioned, which is very specialized services, which we run 100% out of Angola at this moment. So it is possible, the JVs are the best way in, 
but you need to make sure that you have a partner that's willing to transfer the knowledge and you yourself need to make sure that you are prepared to get that knowledge. Some of the, the, the partners get very comfortable with getting their check at the end of the year and they'll do, do that, which meant that after 20 years when the, lo the international partner decides to leave, those companies are actually gone. So you need to make the effort to be able to absorb that technology, to absorb that knowledge, to keep on operating on your own. Uh, and it's, 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 very diff it's very easy to, re to, rest easy, to rest easy with your partners managing it for you as long as it's making money. And then if things go wrong, they'll run away and you have, you have a company which you don't know how to run. So that's a burden on, 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 on the, the local partners to actually know the business and train your staff enough that they can run the business if the partner, your, local, your international partner leaves. Regarding international opportunities, I think it's mm. just a note, it's possible to do. George is a proof, we are a proof. Uh, there's plenty of companies that were created in Angola that, w that were able to actually do business outside. Um, and mentioned something on the beginning, when you mentioned the best, the best practices, I think you will learn more with what we did wrong than what we did good. I think we, you need to catch what was wrongly done on those geographies rather than what was well done. Because the mistakes are the ones we made, made this change. And even Brazil, uh, people talk a lot about Brazil, uh, they admit that they, even today, they are still changing things because they found out that they're not, they're not how they're supposed to do. Correct. So there's a few things on the local content law that they have changed. For example, I not, just add on quickly. You mentioned about uh, a policy and a law where it's got the biggest weight. Brazil is working in a different manner where they're putting that as contract terms. Part of the contract terms they have with the operators and the operators with the service providers. So, which they believe it's easier because commercial law works f faster than uh, general law that you can always appeal and takes longer. Commercial law is easier to impose. So Brazil is working more on having all those local term, uh, terms on the contracts itself, uh, on the production contracts. So it's easier for them to follow. Excellent. I see a big opportunity for our lawyers here as well. So JV agreements are gonna come up. <laughs> so yeah, I think we, we probably use close to the available time. Um, but uh, shall we open for one or two questions, perhaps? Is there a rolling mic? Uh, there's a lady here. Hi, my name is Bertha. So the first question is for knowledge. So knowledge, you mentioned fish rot, which I think is, uh, is sort of a, a dangerous, sorry, you mentioned the fishing industry, which I think can be a dangerous sentiment because we know how that ended. So my question is, what do you think we can do differently in the oil and gas industry? Because I think you're absolutely correct that there's a lot to learn. That's an industry that has transcended uh, you know, our, our time here, uh, but it didn't end too well. So I'm wondering what you think we can do differently so we don't have an oil rot. Uh, my second question is to Mr. Louise, and that one has to do with JVs. So you said that JVs are the only way in. So considering that many times local entrepreneurs, you don't have capital, you don't have expertise, you don't have experience in the industry, what is the, the bargaining power that local partners usually have to convince an international uh, entity to partner with them in some kind of JV structure. So what do you bring to the table as a local partner? How would you answer that question? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that question, Beth. I think we are in Luderets, and I don't need to go far. Uh, the fishing industry has been operating in Luderets, and we know it's a billion dollar industry. Why are we still having uh, situations whereby we have a um, shortage of accommodation, for example? The fishing industry could have actually subsidized that. Why is it that we don't have a tertiary institution within Luderitz? Why is it that a child from Luderitz after grade 12 need to relocate elsewhere in order to get tertiary education? 
So those are the mistakes we should not repeat when it comes to the uh, oil and gas industry. So we should see genuine investment within the local communities. We should see definitely the body reaching communities, reaching uh, the people on the ground, and also looking at the aspect of genuine poverty alleviation, and then also um, training, education, job creation, all those aspects. So many of these things that we're facing today as a country, we could have combated it had we actually had the approach of which we're looking definitely of developing the ground and then industrializing through industries such as the fishing industry of which we could have then created uh, value or other um, entities or sectors from that money we generated. But we definitely know the story, as you mentioned, fish trot. I don't want to go into that conversation, but then we should actually curb the part whereby money is only in the hands of a selected few. It should definitely reach out, but at the same time, what we should also remember is the fact that companies are not charity organizations. Companies are there to make money. So at the same time, as much as we expect companies to do their part, we should then also identify opportunities whereby bodies such as Texas or uh, development funds like the Velvicha fund that was created, for example, should be benefiting, making GDN money that is being invested back into our communities. I think that way it will then help the larger population of Namibia as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to congratulate Bertha for being one of the most active in the conference. I've seen you putting questions on every single panel. Great, great. That's good to see. Um, the JVs are not a benefit only for the local companies. I think the, the, the foreign companies need to see the JVs as a benefit to them as well. Uh, people on the ground know the market, know the logistics, know what the problems are, know what the difficulties are. They know people already that you can hire. So that the message that needs to be put out is that the benefit is not only for the local company to have an international partner. The international partner has a lot of benefits in getting a local partner. And as a local company in Angola, I would always defend that. So I would never go into a country and try and go do it on my own. I don't think it's the correct way, and it's the hard way. But you have, you, have a lot of, you have a lot of bargaining power. And if that power doesn't work, I think then the local content law has, has, a, has a good point to start with. We in Angola, unfortunately, changed the, the law now. We used to make uh, for certain types of, of, of jobs, or even to be considered local, you had to have at least uh, 51% local partnership. Um, it wasn't well operated because some of the companies were just 51% owned but never managed. So I, I would like to make a point here regarding ownership. They, uh, we're talking a lot about ownership during all the presentations and all the law. Ownership is, if it's not well executed, it's just a number. Management of the company in the hands of locals is what you need to achieve uh, more than actually owning just the shares. But again, it's a benefit, and you need to bargain that it's a must, it's a need. We remove that now, and unfortunately, some of the biggest JVs we had in Angola for 30 years, 35 years, are disappearing, because these big companies, they know they can deal directly with operators. Why then I keep a partner any longer? I'll just move out. So it's a mistake, and I think you could have that. We have in Angola, it's split in types of services. Some of them are exclusive for 100% owned companies. Some of them are for companies with Angolan shareholders, and the other ones are just for international companies, which are the high techn technology. So you can also follow a similar route, but I think the message that needs to be sent is that the benefit is also for the international company, not just for the local company. Okay. Um, we are cut. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for Just the insightful comments. Can I? Oh, Ms. Muir, is there a final remark from your side? No. Okay, is it on now? I think what's important also to understand is that you see, the resource is ours. And whether naturally the people like it or not, it's going to be an interest for investors to come. But how, as a nation, you also now organize yourself to ensure that we do not make the mistakes of the past when such resources were actually discovered, we did not have a say, we only found laws that were already put for us, and we're finding actually problematic to actually revise those kind of laws, 
this is really an opportune time for us to make sure that, you know, the laws that we make really actually are in favor of us. I don't think there's any investor that wants to come into a space where there is no private sector. They want to come and work with the private sector in a particular economy as well. This is where some of them will come and make sure that maybe some of their children also go to those schools. They use the health facilities of this particular country as well, the services of that country as well. They want to have the good life that they would have lived in their own economies. So we must actually make sure that we set the bar as well. Preparation is key. And that is why we say it as a chamber, even with the database that we're going to be actually be creating for the vendors. We will have those that are already certified. We will have those that are not even certified, but how do we train them to make sure that they become certified as well, to meet the requirements of all these international companies that are coming in our space as well. So this is a very an opportune time also for us. In also our institutions, institutions like NIMT, if that was not actually being covered, maybe this is where we need to start looking at investing so that we don't always look at the neighbors as everything else must come from there. How do we start capacitating our institutions as well? to be able to meet those standards that are required by these companies that are coming in. Excellent. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> While, while they are doing the group photo, I noticed that the substantive person for this chair is back in town. <laughs> so Ricardo, we started with the program and uh, we have uh, just had a presentation by charity and the, this panel discussion. So I will hand over to you to take care of uh, session six uh, and beyond. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's this this situation. Is, yeah, it's a very very tough one. But I think it's only fair to just explain myself. <laughs> now. I think the, the obvious one is that, oh, we partied last night, and so we're here. <laughs> but the real one is, uh, I lost my old man this morning. Yeah, grandfather. So it's not a, the partying was there, yes. But we always showed up. We partied the day before and the previous day also. So we always show up. But we just had a bit of a, a tight morning, myself personally. I didn't want to shade. I wanted to keep it professional. But, yeah, that's how it happens. And when you have a platform like this, of course, we have to... I don't want you to walk out of here and think that, you know, we are disorganized as the organization, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's the news. But we'll see the program through for today. As they say, um, the country must continue functioning, yeah? So... We'll finish the job for today. But that's unfortunately the situation early in the morning. I, I would have been here, but you think that you're strong, but it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, Mr. BC will just run the second session, and then um, after session six, I think um, I'll take over, and then we'll close up the program. But thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. And I, I believe that all of us now understand the, the situation. And I really want to express our condolences to, to Ricardo personally and to the broader family for the loss of the beloved one. Ricardo, uh, be strong. And uh, we are with you and the family in our thoughts and our prayers. Thank you. Okay, with that said, uh, 
I want us to continue to the next session. Uh, the previous session has really brought up quite a number of very interesting ideas. Number one, I must uh, thank the, the panelists and particularly knowledge. We, we can see that he's not only a politician, but he's an astute business person. You could see the way the words were flowing. He understands the, the business and uh, we really look forward to see you more in this industry. Secondly, I think we have also heard that we are at a fairly good base in terms of where to start. I think we have some basics in place and much more still needs to be done. So all is not lost. Let's just take what we have and then build on that. And of course, let us partner. Let us learn from the mistakes of our neighbors, of others who have gone through this journey and just build on that, take the positives and address the negatives or the challenges that they had. With that said, I want to call on stage the participants of uh, session six that will be dealing with uh, that will be dealing with uh, the topic mainstreaming standard operating procedures to safeguard Namibian local content. The moderator will be uh, Mr. George de Moraes from Kaeso. He has made a very impressive presentation yesterday, and it will be nice to hear his voice again, to share his knowledge and ex expertise. And then I can come and call up his panelists. Thank you, George. Good morning. All right, so uh, we are going to start today with uh, Mr. Emmanuel Annie. He is going to uh, share with us a presentation regarding partnerships. He is from uh, Bridge Taylor and uh, he's ready to take the stage. Hello, everybody. Good morning. OK, so I think that the, the previous presentation really uh, ended on a note that opens up to start a conversation around partnerships. Uh, and Beth's question really was about how do you position yourself to be able to attract some of these partnerships that will most likely come into the space. And, and really, that's, that's the conversation I want us to have this morning. So. We would really look at the, the ideal situation for local content uh, in a country, what you really want to achieve. Then we will go through some of the barriers that, that may come when you want to go into that sustainable local content policy. We'll, we'll dwell on the opportunities that are in the space, and then we would spend some time on how you position your business to be able to attract some of these uh, partnerships, and then we'll conclude with a way forward. Does that look like a good outline? Yeah? Okay. So every country really desires that uh, when players come into the market, they live with a sustainable footprint. You know, COVID taught all of us that when there is an emergency, the foreigners will leave, and you'll be left with the locals to be able to run, run the space. Uh, in other places where there has been war, you realize that uh, the foreign entities would have to pull out. Uh, imagine if Russia was Namibia and something like this happened and all the foreign players were moving out. You would want to have local players who can sustain the industry for you. So it's every country's desire that the infrastructure is owned by the locals. You would want to have a direct impact on the communities uh, yesterday, uh, Doc was saying how you want the impact of the oil and gas to be felt in the people of Ludwig's life, right? The people who are uh, directly impacted by the activities, they want to experience or have an impact on, on their lives. And then you want the partnerships that come into the country to be on equal footing. You don't want people to be fronting foreign companies. You want them to really have uh, 
uh, equal footings in, in those partnerships. And then the last bit, which I've mentioned earlier, is that you want that skilled workforce that can take over the industry when the foreigners are gone, right? But I would quickly uh, allude to what uh, George said yesterday about what has happened in Angola, right? Even after uh, 50 years, he said, the value of the uh, local participation is just about 2%, he, he said, right? So just setting up local companies to play, you realize that they just go for the low-hanging fruits. So I've had catering, meet and greet, uh, uh, things like this. And those are very low uh, uh, value activities. It may sound like a lot for you, but if you look at the bigger picture, uh, where the local players usually uh, stay, it, it's, 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 it's low margins and very low value. So you want to move up the chain. You want to, as much as possible, be able to move into some of the technical areas. And I, I want to propose to you that partnerships could be one of the, the ways to do that. Uh, different countries, and because I'm from West Africa, I would, I would use the West African uh, countries as, as, an, an, as an example. So, for example, in Nigeria, and we heard a lot about Nigeria yesterday, uh, that's a very developed market. There are a lot of uh, local players. And where Nigeria is, is that they go to the point of work shares. So uh, they, uh, the law is structured such that if, say, Total wants to give a contract, it would be a tripartite contract between uh, Total, a local player, and an international player, right? So there is specific work scope that the local player can, can do in that work, work share. And what does, that does is that it makes the the local players emboldened and empowered, and in some of the contracts I saw in Nigeria, the money actually goes to the local player, and the local player now pays the international player, right? So the local players are now very uh, strong, and they are able to now uh, go chase their own kind of contracts. Then we have Ghana that is doing uh, not the same as Nigeria, but uh, they went in more for the uh, joint ventures. So in Ghana, to be able to participate in the upstream oil and gas, you need to register uh, a, lo a locally incorporated joint venture, which must have a minimum 10% uh, ownership by a local, right? So what this does is that the local and the foreigner comes together into one entity, and they are supposed to execute their contracts for the client. Uh, the whole idea is so that when, once they keep working together in a joint venture, uh, there will be knowledge transfer, there will be skills transfer, and the regulator is quite particular about the plan or the strategy that the foreign partner has to be able to transfer technology. So there are specific uh, reports that you need to do annually, and you need to show and demonstrate that you are passing on some, some skills to, to, to the local player. Then the latest one is Ivory Coast, uh, which was just passed last year. Um, and that one really, the, what they tried to do was to categorize uh, uh, the, the, the industry or the, the work into three main categories. So we have category A, which is local companies owned by 51% locals. Category B, which has, is just a partnership. Uh, it doesn't have to be locally incorporated and that can do a certain set of jobs. And there's category C, which is for uh, offshore, ultra deep, where foreign, part, part, foreign players can, can go in alone, right? So many countries are trying to do uh, this just for the sole purpose that they can transfer technology and they can transfer skills to the locals because th this is really the ideal situation. You, you, you want your locals to grow in their competence and in their skills and not just keep doing the, the low-hanging fruits. But despite all this, uh, it's still difficult because uh, most of these uh, foreign companies, the, the technology is their inter intellectual property, yeah? Uh, and after investing millions of dollars on, on this uh, intellectual property, you don't really want to let it go that easily, right? So, so that, that's really a, bi a big challenge. And then the... the the local players many times don't even have the capacity to be able to absorb 
all the learnings. So I saw in the previous presentation that you need to have that capacity to be able to absorb, understand what is going on. Otherwise, you would be working with a partner and you can't even take what they are giving you. you. You can't even identify the opportunities in the space where you are playing. And this is where many people now resort to just fronting. So I own the company, but I'm not involved in the operations and I'm not involved in, in, in what's going on. And then the way most of these foreign companies are structured, the technology really sits in the HQ and there is a support center that helps with the daily operations. So you may not see most of the technological um, implementation in country. Uh, it's usually sitting in some tech center. And then the third one is that, uh, similar to the intellectual properties, they have a big R&D budget, which they have invested. And to give it out freely is, is a bit difficult. So it's important that both the foreign and the local players now begin to see the, the need to, to partner, right? And what we've tried to do is to just do uh, a, a comparison between where the foreign players sit and where the local players sit, right? So in terms of expertise, yes, normally the foreign players would have more expertise than the local players. Uh, for services, uh, usually by the time the foreign player is coming, they know exactly what they want to do. Some of the uh, local players know what they want to do, but they may not be too sure where they want to play. But that alignment is very key for you to be able to attract that partnership. In terms of influence, the foreign partner may have influence on the operators. I mean, they, they, they know them from other jurisdictions and they are able to get the work. But the local partner also has some sort of influence because they know the governments, they know the people, and they are more familiar with the terrains than, 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 the, than the foreign partner. In terms of infrastructure, uh, the, the, the foreign partner may have equipment, but the local partner may have the land, right? So it could be a, an even spread there. Uh, and then on funding, usually the foreign partner is coming in with, with much more investment than, than the local partner have. The last bit is, is on, the, on the legal bit, which is just the, sh the setup that has been done and the local content laws that exist in, in the country. So if you map this out, you realize that both parties have something that they are bringing to the table, right? It is not just the foreign partner who has everything. The local partner also has uh, some local intelligence, which many times comes in uh, very handy. And I had one, one speaker say that you are not going to a country without having a local partner to support them in, in doing that, right? So we, we have to understand that as, as locals, we have uh, some leverage and it's, it's a win-win for these partnerships to happen. So how, how it works is that the local partners is on, on, on local players is on one side and they are constrained by financial and human capital. The foreign partners are constrained by uh, local know-how and, and familiarity with the market. And what I have seen in the jurisdictions where we've worked is that without having some uh, governmental or enterprise support organizations uh, uh, trying to influence the process, that partnership may never work, right? Um, I mean, if I can come into the country and do business uh, without uh, any legislation or without finding any local partners to partner with, then I would just go ahead. So there needs to be some uh, role by governments and enterprise support organizations to either one, identify the local players in the space, try to de-risk uh, their operations or uh, set them up nicely so that the foreign players could find them uh, interesting enough to even have those, those, those conversations. Okay, okay so far? Yeah? All right. So really, it, this is the time that you have to be ready. If you are, you are waiting to see a, an influx of foreign companies before you start getting your company ready, then, then you, you'll be late, right? So I, I just want to propose just four ideas that we can use to make, make our companies ready. One is the, the setup. 
last year when Ivory Coast uh, issue came up, one of our clients asked us to go help them to find local partners. And before we went, we had lined up a few potentials, we had spoken to them, and then we went into the country to do the due diligence. And clearly, you could see those that have, had set up properly had so many suitors, I, I must say, right? To the extent that one company that, you know, had his office set up and they had all the incorporation documents, they had the board, they had this, they had that, they were receiving all the attention. There are others with ideas, but they had not set up properly. The, the companies, they said, oh, it's for me, but uh, it's not my name that is on it. I will change it later, that, that, that kind of, you know. So these, these things don't, 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 don't help. The second thing is that in the oil and gas industry, we are really big on compliance, right? So we want to find out, are you paying your taxes? Uh, what is your HSC policy? Do you have a policy on anti-corruption? Uh, how is your, is your compliance? If you're a company that is not complying, uh, we would find you very risky and nobody wants to, to do business with you, right? So compliance is extremely important. In fact, if you have, uh, uh, if you win any work with any of these uh, players, they would come to your office and they would do audits. They want to audit your procurements, they want to audit your systems. It, it's, so from day one, you need to understand that compliance is going to be key for you going forward. The next one is value, right? You yourself need to determine what you want to bring, right? I, I have met companies that have still not decided what they want to do in the space. So they are like, oh, I have a company. You can do anything you want with it. Uh, which, what do you want to do? And then we will partner with you that makes it look like you are not really invested in the process. So you have to determine what is the services I want to provide, what is the value I want to bring, and then it's now easier to match between you. So if, if the, the company wants to do, like uh, yesterday the discussions I was having, uh, you have container rentals, right? And then you say, oh, I want another company that is doing containers. And then they'll say, oh, George's company is doing that. That becomes an, an easier match. Right. He's already invested in the space, he's already doing it. Or because we like to use catering, uh, you, you uh, decide that you want to do catering and there is another company that is doing catering, then it's easier to do the match. But when you have not decided which space you want to play, uh, then it's, it's difficult because it looks like you are trying to do everything. Um, the last bit is strategy. You want to go into the partnership with a clear understanding of what you want to extract from that relationship. Uh, to go without that strategy is, is really too blind. Um, and in the end, you may, you may lose out on the whole relationship. And uh, we've seen uh, partnerships that after several years, there is no skills transfer, there is no technology transfer, there is no knowledge transfer. Because the, the participants did not strategize enough on what they want to achieve at the end of the day. So just to conclude, it's important that we allow there to be some sort of a, a work share arrangement where the local person knows this is what I want to do, this is what I want the foreign partner to do, right? You have to have that clear conversation on how you are sharing the work and how technology is being transferred. And I, I really think that there has to be uh, a catalyst to have the conversations going, either between government or enterprise support organizations, to begin to have the conversations where these uh, foreign players are talking to, to the locals. And the, the last bit is that uh, in as much as, yes, I'm a foreigner, uh, we would want little government intervention. I think it's extremely important for it to happen. Otherwise, uh, these uh, partnerships don't, don't, don't come that naturally. Right. It has to be uh, encouraged right, for, 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 for it to happen. So it's a win-win situation, really, and, and I think that both, both parties have a lot to benefit from, from that conversation. So thank you very much, um, and we are happy to reconnect and then and, and talk more on how your companies can be ready for partnerships. Thank you.
Emmanuel, thank you very much for uh, all the insight. Very interesting to see how international companies, local companies, and the government can work together to make sure that we build strong companies, strong local companies. We will continue with this session. I will call now Ms. Olivia and Ms. Michelle. Thank you for joining the stage. And we will start with the next panel. So there was someone yesterday, they were saying that the oil field in Namibia is full of strong women. Here's a proof again. So uh, I would say a clap of applause for them. <laughs> so let's start by presenting yourself, please. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Um, my name is Olivia Jean Jaja. I handle marketing communications for a company in Nigeria called Avion Offshore. We're a local fabrication company. We've been in existence for over 15 years, actually longer than that, but as a lo local Nigerian company, we've been existing for 15 years. Um, I have experience in marketing, communications, media, PR, um, local content, and much more. Okay, good. good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Ngawiake. I am the senior uh, um, government relations um, representative for Halliburton. Halliburton is basically, I would call it the donkey. Um, it's a service company uh, that's basically um, uh, doing uh, all the um, work plans for the uh, operators. So we basically are the, are the donkeys for the industry, upstream industry. <laughs> because, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, thank you for that. I can already see that this will be a very interesting panel. We have a local company and an international company. So, it will be interesting to see the uh, mm -hmm. insight from uh, both views. Starting with uh, Miss Olivia, how does Avian Offshore tailor its SOPs to enhance local content while maintaining operational efficiency? Okay, so because we are a local company, fabrication in Nigeria, um, and we understood the struggles that it took us moving from a South African company into a Nigerian company, um, not having enough visibility, not getting enough jobs, um, we understand the value of local content. So with that, when we have to, although we have all our standards, um, we make sure that we take a look into the local expertise you know that we have in Nigeria so all the local expertise that we tend to hire we have to make sure that they have the right qualifications they have the right certifications um, they have done all their checks and they can deliver then also when it comes to resources we make sure that we source for all the things that we need locally now in Nigeria it can be difficult. There's a lot of issues when it comes to manufacturing, electricity, um, manpower, but we ensure that we get all the resources. As long as they, we can find them in country, we will source from them. And unless we don't find them, then we now start looking at the opportunities outside to import. Um, and usually that actually is more expensive. So usually we'll tend to just try and get it from, from um, locally, from, the, from, the, from our sources. <laughs> um, and then also, when it comes to communities, um, we're very particular about our communities and we want to make sure that we engage them, we want to make sure that they're a part of our process. We don't just, you know, leave them without knowing that they, they, um, we have their backs. So we always pour it right into them, we give them whatever it is they need um, within reason. And um, yeah, but we still we manage all our stands accordingly. So as because because of the kind of company we are, we are in fabrication, you cannot afford to misstep when it comes to quality. Yeah. So we maintain all our standards, but then we find the best of the best locally. Thank you, Olivia. 
So we can already see that there are quite a few challenges to uh, make sure that uh, you can maintain the your level of your SOPs locally. And the next question uh, with that in mind goes to uh, Ms. Michelle. What challenges have you faced in maintaining balance between the global operation and the standards, uh, local um, global operational standards and local customization? Um, uh, thank you for the question. I think the one thing that we really have to understand is uh, when you're operating in the oil and gas industry, it's definitely an international industry that is actually based on international standards. And really, um, when it comes to Halliburton, we really uh, have developed international standards that are actually, uh, you know, based on uh, the learnings that we had and as well as the industry learnings as well. So uh, in terms of uh, that, we haven't really experienced that because we do have, um, we, we still stand true to the red way of doing things. And, and, and when we actually get into a local, uh, um, let's say for instance, a, a country like Namibia, we would look at the, um, let's say for instance, standards that are actually more stringent and that is actually what we will adopt, but otherwise we're still gonna stand true to the international um, uh, global standards that are there because they are there to safeguard you know, the industry and making sure, because we know of all the incidents that actually happen, uh, have, have been happening in the oil and gas industry, and for that reason we cannot compromise uh, the standards. Um, so there is always a nice flow of you know, um, adaptability of, of, of global as well as local um, uh, standards. Yeah. Thank you for Thank that, you. Michelle. So knowing that the international standards are the reference, I would say, how, Emmanuel, do you see the local companies adapting to that? What are the difficulties that you've seen in your experience? Um, I, I think... For Emmanuel. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Okay, great. Uh, and, and really, when she was talking about the challenges, and I'm, I'm glad you asked, but I, I worked in one of the multinationals oil for, for a long time. And you can imagine if, for example, you live in a country where public transportation does not have seat belts, and you go to work in the tra public transport or a taxi, you don't wear your seat belt. And now you work for a company, that insist that you wear your seat belt every time. I mean, the company I used to work for, uh, you could be fired if you don't wear your seat belt. You can just be fired, right? Um, so another example, you're in a country where when you go for lunch, you have wine. Wine is normal to have during lunchtime. And then now you work for an international company that says that you cannot have alcohol within the, the working hours, right? So these become true challenges that you have to battle with. You have employees who are uh, vested in the local contest, and now you are imposing standards that are global in nature. I mean, one that we don't like to talk about is the issue of, say, gifts and things like this. Most of these companies have very clear laws, right? Um, in my previous company, you cannot give a gift above $200. Uh, if you live in a, a contest where you give gifts and you accept dinner offers and you accept that kind of things, then these standards now become a challenge to your, to your daily operation. And you have to do a lot of work to get your whole team aligned with, with that new standard operating practice. Thank you for that. Coming back to uh, Olivia, so what measures are you taking to ensure quality and performance uh, when, worker, when working with um, new partners? So when it comes to quality in Nigeria, I mean, basically in the oil and gas industry, quality is very important. Um, as a company, at Zavion Offshore, we are ISO certified. So we adhere to the highest quality standards, and that is what we're known for. So even when we're pricing, 
we tell you that you're going to get what you're looking for, what you're asking for, according to the standards, according to the certifications, and according to, the, according to everything that you are asking us for, we will deliver. Um, so when, that come, when it comes to local companies, we also have those high standards. We ensure that these, um, the, the products have gone to the, if they're, if they're providing us um, products, it goes to the proper checks. Um, they can just, all the, there's a, all quality checks, there are permits, there are fees that you have to pay, you have to go through a qualification system of the government. We ensure that you have all of that first before we can take you on. Um, so there's a thorough onboarding process as well. So with all of that, um, we make sure that you, your, your track record as well, what have you done? What have you achieved? What have you accomplished? What are the projects that you have delivered without any issues? Um, and yeah, that's basically what we do. We make sure that everything is, is all the facts and checks are, are done properly. Thank you for that. So just giving a little bit of background. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with ISO. ISO is a interna um, yes, international standard organization. And uh, it's uh, an organization that establishes certain standards of quality for management, for HSE, for environment, and so forward. So this was just to give a little bit of yeah. context. So coming back to uh, Michelle, you are an international company. You represent an international company operating at a worldwide level, Halliburton, and you have a lot of technology. So how does technology play a role in implementing and maintaining SOPs in Aliburton? Um, uh, I think the one thing that we need to be clear of, uh, to be able to, to uh, maximize the asset values of our clients, it's very important that uh, technology is actually of the, uh, you know, uh, at the forefront of our operations. So uh, basically, um, uh, uh, all the operations are actually embedded in uh, d digitalization, and we also obviously help our clients to do so. Um, so yeah, so um, it, 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 it makes it um, efficient and reliable uh, operations for our clients, and um, uh, we, tr we actually stand true to our uh, value proposition, which is actually you know, to, to maximize our um, clients um, assets uh, value basically yeah. thank you for that Michelle so following that thought Emmanuel how can a local company bridge this gap of technology yeah. uh, that, that, that's really the question for today yeah? because <laughs> one is knowing even what are the the standards that, that that's even the, the starting point what are the standards and where am I? And then now you have to map that bridge uh, to, to the standards. So I think that you start by having an awareness of the market that you are in. Um, I, I, for the longest time, if we were going to do a, a tender or a bid with a company, we already wanted to start looking at what are their requirements. And then once you have that understanding, you can uh, back re-engineer the process to now put it into your own procedures. So I think that we all need to have a clear understanding of what is required and where we are. And that, that's the starting point. And then we can now start navigating to, to reach the, those standards. And that's where, uh, like I said in my presentation, the, the government comes in by giving that kind of training and then the enterprise support organizations like ourselves come in to help you kind of bridge that gap. Okay, thank you. On that thought, Olivia, how would you, what kind of advice could you give as a local company? Um, what should you do to improve and make sure that you are on a path to improve your standards to satisfy the oil and gas industry? Um, <clears throat> I would say that 
you definitely should be looking to do a lot of partnerships, um, foster partnerships within each other, you know, find the community gaps, know what the community needs, um, also local expertise, upskill, invest in knowing what is going on in the industry, what are the regulations, um, how can I plug in, what are the gaps that are missing and where can I bring my own expertise into those gaps. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'll drill a little bit more on that. On a practical point uh, of view, can you share with us how did you do it? Okay, so for instance, as a company in Nigeria, um, we ensure that we go through, we ensure that we um, check to make sure that we know we're up to date with the news. We want to know what's going on in, the, you know, in, the, in Nigeria, for instance. So in Namibia, knowing what are the new, new regulations that are coming up, what are the new laws and what are the new policies. Um, also meeting, coming to conferences like this that share knowledge. You make sure that you come to these type of conferences where you can network, see what other people are doing, hear what the industry government officials are saying. Um, then what else? Then, yes, then also to do with trainings making sure that you know what are the, what are the certifications that I need. Um, if I want to be in this industry, if I, want to be in, if I want to do, for instance, flanges or fittings, what are the certifications I need in order to participate? Um, then when it comes to look, um, international companies, like if you want to get on their vendor registration, what are the requirements? What do I need to do in order to be a vendor for these IOCs? Very good. You mentioned vendor list and be approved in the vendor list of the IOCs or the uh, international service companies. Yeah. So, Michelle, how does Ali Burton mm -hmm. uh, set standards to approve companies to uh, their vendor list? How do you engage with the uh, local companies mm -hmm. to, yeah. uh, to approve them in your vendor list? Um, yeah, I think um, I, I'm still going to go back to the, um, uh, what actually anchors uh, Halliburton. And it's definitely um, um, in, in, in country value creation, so which means it is actually entrenched within our DNA to want to collaborate with, uh, with local companies. So the one thing for sure that uh, Halliburton is good at is actually to uh, take um, a local company by, by hand and making sure that the necessary um, uh, uh, standard, uh, standard operating procedures are actually, you know, understood. And, and yeah, so, so, so it's, a, it's, it's a journey, it's a process, and which we are willing to actually go, go on with in, in terms of uh, local companies. Because it's not just, a, I think everybody is talking about the benefits. It's not just a benefit to the country but a benefit to, the, um, uh, to us uh, by cutting costs. Um, and when we cut costs, it makes us compet uh, competitive. Not only does it actually make us competitive, it makes Namibia competitive because Namibia is not the only oil producing company. So we need to also make sure that cost is actually uh, you know, uh, being uh, controlled. So that is why um, Halliburton is actually quite keen on collaborating with uh, um, local companies and also obviously taking their hands and making sure that they, you know, adhere to uh, the international standards. Yeah. Thank you. Following up uh, on that, Emmanuel, you've been working with a lot of local companies. Uh, have you had experience in helping them get access to vendor lists? Yeah, uh, actually, I think just uh, a year ago, uh, there, was, there was this company that came with that specific request, which I thought was a bit strange, but really, the specific request was, can you help me get onto a vendor list, right? And it just lets you know how important it is. Um, on this panel, I mean, the way it's, it's presented, you will think that it's a walk in the park to get onto Halliburton's uh, vendor list, but it is not the case, right? There is, uh, we've spoken about compliance. Um, do you have 
uh, a tax clearance certificate. Sometimes they want to have assurance that you can manage the work they are giving you. So they want to find out, okay, what, what's your financial uh, capability to be able to do this job? Uh, many times they want to come and do a, a base audit. They want to come and inspect your facility, check that, okay, you said you can do this fabrication. Uh, where are you doing it? Do you have the certifications for it, right? So it's indeed uh, possible and companies do ask for that kind of help, right? Because it's kind of a tall list. But I would, I would like to, just like she said, it's really a journey. It's not a, a magic wand, right? So somebody can't come to you today and say, can you get me on a vendor list? And then you just go to Halle Burton and then you get them on a, on a vendor list. It, it doesn't work like It's really a journey because you need to show that you have the capacity. You need to show that you are compliant to their processes. And you need to show that you have a bit of track record to be able to do the work that you want to do. So yes, I agree. There is some consulting involved, but really it's the journey that you have to be on uh, as a local player. So uh, a question to the three of you. So the way you're, show, or you're talking about it, it seems that it is a, a very heavy administrative work. Is this just a paperwork exercise? Starting with Olivia. Is it just paperwork? Is it just a paperwork exercise? No, um, it's a thorough exercise. Well, there is a lot of paperwork because you have to get, well, like you said, tax, tax clearances, mm -hmm. um, certifications, and in Nigeria, it's a thorough process. Like you, there's a, a Nigerian government process you are called the NGQS. You have to go through that. Um, you have to go through D DPR, which is like a to get the permits, and mm -hmm. you know, to get the permits, there are loads of funds you have to have to, you know, to pay for um, to be participating in. So yes, the, 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 there's a lot of admin. But there's also legwork. You have to do a lot of government relations, um, making sure you understand who is in charge of um, what projects, you know, and, and mm. creating that stakeholder management with them as well. So yeah, it's not just admin. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think from uh, my point of view, it's definitely a very necessary um, process that has to be done. And um, uh, taking from Halliburton how we do things is um, if we have to come into a country, we've got a, a country entry uh, sheet, and that is the process basically that we go through to make sure that we uh, look at the governing um, uh, laws and regulations and policies that are actually in place, uh, and uh, when it comes to tax, when it comes to local content and, and, and all that stuff. So um, for us, it is very necessary to comply with the laws and regulation and policies that we actually, you know, are in terms of uh, where we are operating. So, so, so it is necessary. It's a necessary one. It's administrative, but one of those things that compliance is core to our operations as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as a big international service company, you have several departments. You'll have one for quality, you'll have one for HSC, mm -hmm. you'll have one for local content, um, you'll have one for finance. So do you have all these people getting together and say, hey, now let's pay a visit to a local content company to see exactly if they comply with our checklist, with our audits? Is that the way it happens? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Depending on uh, which uh, product, uh, we call it product service lines, Mm -hmm. um, I needing that specific vendor. Uh, definitely, it's a collective um, process uh, that that HSC has to come by. Finance have to uh, be part of it because obviously we need to make sure in terms of costing is actually within our you know pockets. So so it's a collective uh, roundtable um, process that we actually have to go through uh, to make sure that it's a. Um, uh, this synergy in, within the uh, PSLs and so on, yeah. So just to, to clarify, HSC is Health, Safety and Environment. I mean, in the oil field, we are big in acronyms for some reason. <laughs> um, so, e Emmanuel, have you participated in uh, audits of this nature? 
Well, uh, in my previous role, um, I, was, I was the controller for the region for one of the service companies. Uh, so like she rightly said, it's really a combination of departments. So if um, your, your file comes up, and the way it really works in practice is that they will not just come to your office to come and do an audit. Uh, it's either you are applying to be on the vendor list, you fill the application form, it has all the data that you need to produce, including your financial statements and, and things like that. So financial statements will go to the finance department to review it. Your HSC will go to the HSC department to review it. And then, like she rightly said, at the end of the day, there's a round table that determines whether you pass this and you pass that and you pass that. So you could pass some and you've, you can fill some, right? And then at the end of the day, you are, you are, you are approved as a vendor, right? So, so that, that's really the process. And uh, I, I must say, the, we, we do this because the, the, these companies also need to give themselves assurance. Um, if something goes wrong, I need to be able to tell the company that I did check. You no, know, the guy had, yeah, the guy had this and he had that, so something must have gone wrong, right? But if you don't do that due diligence, then the company is setting itself up for uh, legal suits or challenges that they may have with its uh, sponsors. Okay. And what happens if you fail? Is that it? Is it game over? Not at all. I mean, for most of the kind companies, and I think it's been said several today, it's in the interest of these uh, players to have the locals participate. Because many times it's cheaper, it's more reliable, and it is good for their reporting as well, right? Today, ESG reporting is very big for most of the corporates, and you want to show that you have local impact that you are supporting local industry and that you are making an impact where you are working. So it's in the, it's in the interest of these companies to have as many uh, local companies on board as possible. I have seen in jurisdictions where, and, and I did it when I was in that, that role, where we organize the vendors, local vendors, and we actually train them on how to be able to pass our checklist. We, we give them capability to be able to say, hey, you know, this is how you should do it. If you don't have an HSC uh, program, this is a template you could use. Uh, we, we actually help them to be able to pass the, these uh, hurdles because we need, every company needs the locals to play. Very good. So it's very important to understand that the objective of this uh, audit of these visits is actually to help and make sure that the local companies are raised to a standard where they become compliant. Uh, at Caeso, we had many audits in our base. We didn't pass all the time. And when we didn't pass, it was a lesson learned. It was identifying the gaps that we had in our system that needed to be improved so that we could reach the compliance stage. Mm -hmm. Very good. I will ask one last question. Is there anything that you want to share that I did not ask? Starting with Olivia. Anything you'd like to share? What do you say? I missed that. Is there anything that you would like to share that I did not ask? Um, I would just say that when it comes to, first of all, Namibia is prime right now, so everybody is looking into Namibia. So you should be really thankful for this opportunity. It's great that you have oil and gas, but there's also an opportunity for you guys to see what others have done, especially countries like Nigeria, see what we've gotten right and see what we've gotten wrong, um, and understand the value of local content and what that means for you. And again, Namibia is a really beautifully small country, <laughs> so... <laughs> That means that everybody has an opportunity to actually play a role. Um, and I think that you should definitely look into that. Thank you, Olivia. Michelle? Yes, uh, I think the most important thing is uh, we have seen a lot of examples from different countries. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's all good and well to want to take on, let's say, for instance, the Norwegian uh, model uh, but if we do not have strong institutions, you know, that would actually be able to implement, let's say, the local content and make sure that every Namibia actually benefit from this, 
then we're not actually doing the, you know, uh, uh, Namibia justice. So, um, so for, I think it's a call to the government to make sure that we have strong institutions um, that obviously uh, would root out, you know, corruption, uh, that would make sure that policies are not actually dusting up on tables, uh, that are, that are uh, you know, implementers and people that would actually monitor and actually, you know, be able to, to assess whether these policies are actually, um, what is it, working or not. Because at the end of the day, I think 10 years from now or 15 years from now, we need to actually make a comparison and see uh, where we were and where we at. Did it work or did it not work? So I think that is most important to really get very uh, strong institutions that would actually um, uh, drive these policies uh, in the country. And the, obviously the international companies that Halliburton is obviously here to assist uh, where we can. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Manuel? Yeah, George, I think you asked all the good questions. Uh, just by closing remark, um, it's really an exciting time for Namibia. Some of us jumped onto the plane to just come and see Namibia, see what's happening here, right? So it's, it's really fantastic time, really exciting time. Uh, and just so you know, like everybody is gunning for you. Um, the, everybody's trying to court you, right? So this is really the opportunity, and I think that as local players, we need to man up to the tax and to the challenge because from my experience in oil and gas, it only makes you better. It, it, makes, it makes your standards go higher. Uh, things that you can do in other industries, in oil and gas, it will not fly, right? It's really high standards, so I would encourage everybody to, to jump onto the bandwagon now, right, and, and, and experience the, the, the thrill of the ride. Thank you. Very good. Olivia, Michelle, and Manuel, thank you. Thank you. We, uh, well, a round of applause for them. Thank you. <laughs> and we are now open for Q&A. Oh. Yes, can we have a mic, please? <laughs> Gentlemen over there. Oh, there. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm a local entrepreneur. My name is Andrew Angula. I'm actually from the coast of Fish Bay. And um, I actually wanted to speak yesterday again just to give advice because as entrepreneurs, we are here to get information and how it's done. And that is what I want to hear. And that is what I'm going to say. The lady that spoke yesterday about Namport, I'm not sure if she's here because she asked if Namport is doing what they're saying. Oh, yes. Um, yes, Namport actually, um, through, we were actually very lucky to work with Namport and a whole lot of companies that we mentioned, Halliburton as well, and um, the coastal mines. So these people have databases, procurement databases, which Hyphen also has. Me being an entrepreneur, I already went to go give my uh, documents to Hyphen. I don't know if you guys have done it. If not, their offices are just here. So what they do is that um, they give you their criteria, what they need. You give all, if all your documents are in order, you, they put you on the database as um, whatever business you are in. Uh, they do make contact with you. If your, pro if your profile looks very nice, let's just put it that way, very nice, very professional, they will definitely make contact with you. One thing that stood out from Namport was that they made it easy for everyone around Namibia to access their website. On their website is all the tenders that they are currently having at Namport, Luderitz, and Wolfish Bay, where you just uh, digitally um, attach your documents on the site or, or the tender that you want. And um, if you're lucky, they will definitely give you a call where you then give your documents or you get called in for something. Um, I did write something because I knew this was going to happen. Where's my phone? Right here. Uh, basically, uh, what I, information that I wanted to give to also make it easier was that, and that there's a thing or a company or it's a site called Web Opportunities. Most entrepreneurs will be uh, aware of that one, but it's Web Opportunity basically gives you an opportunity to tender or, um, yes, to tender for 
or a few companies, all over, major companies all over Namibia. And um, it's quite intense because if, if you don't know how to tender, you don't know how to apply for a tender, there's a, a company called Taranawa, which they also then give you classes or information on how to acquire these tenders. Um, and then there's the local one. There's a lady, I, I don't have a number. I do have a number. I don't know if I'm allowed to give it because I don't know. Uh, she, she's in Vintuk. It's a WhatsApp number. So basically she has a platform where she loads all the tenders in Namibia. Makes it easier for all of us. Um, I did send a message to ask if I'm allowed to share the number. So I'm just waiting for that. And then I will give the number where you pay your 50 $50 per month, and you have access to all the tenders of Namibia uh, in the, like everything you see in the newspaper and much more that will be available on that WhatsApp group. I think that's about it. Thank you. So very important information for those who want to participate on tenders. There was a gentleman over here. All right, thank you. My name is Patlomeo Chanja and I just uh, have a few uh, questions for, actually just one question for Miss Olivia. I think as a, an international company, uh, with interne uh, as a local company in Nigeria with international certifications uh, in the fabri fabrication space, I think it's really commendable that your company is involving local participation by you know, sourcing from vendors. Uh, not to sound redundant, but I just wanted you to just share more again on how you balance, you know, between keeping strict international requirements and the need, you know, to have flexibility on onboarding programs for local vendors. And also if you can just share a little bit of advice to our international community as well. Thank you. Okay, so you want the advice, right, on, on um, local content. So. First of all, because, like I said, because of the kind of company we are, fabrication and the kind, kind, of, kind of structures that we actually have to construct, um, international standards, we go by that first. So we make sure we have all our certifications. Um, we do not cut corners. Um, we do not cut quality for any reason. Um, because I think that's what makes us very attractive to the oil gas, um, to the oil, international oil companies, because they know that with us, you're getting the top, the highest standards of quality. Um, so we balance that by also making sure that we equip all our staff. They have the proper training. Training department is huge, um, and then we also, when we ha we do, we have a great succession plan. So. Because of the Local Content Act, we have to make sure that even though we bring in expats from other countries that have the expertise, there is a succession plan. So if there is a project, we make sure that after the, after the project, is, project is done, the expertise and skills are transferred to a local, um, to a local one of our, basically a Nigerian worker one of our Nigerian employees, so they become the managers. So now we have like 9% of our managers are Nigerians with the expertise. So um, I think that's pretty much. Thank you, Olivia. Any other question in the room? Yes, sir. It must be me. <laughs> I would like to, to ask Emmanuel. Oh, okay. In most of the policies, they are suggesting certain percentage of shareholding. Mm -hmm. uh, in Guyana, 51. Namibia is suggesting 51. In uh, Ivory Coast. Angola, they take it away. Do this percentage shareholding to local partners really matter? Mm -hmm. Thank is you. Really what? Ah, OK. Oh boy, when Doc asks you a question, then you are getting scared. But uh, I, I think your, your guess is as good as mine, right? Um, th there is the paper ownership, 
and then there is what happens in, in practice. And I think that if you just leave it at the shareholding level without translating it to the management level, uh, you, may, you may miss it. You may miss it. And so what at least we did in Ghana is to say that with the, the, the shares allocation, on top of that, you have to show a clear plan of how the local is involved in the business. There has to be a, a, a clear plan. And if you don't produce that plan, your license is not renewed the next year. Right? So you have to be, there has to be a clear plan. And then year on year, you need to report on how you are achieving that plan. Right? But Doc, really, if you leave it to the shareholding alone, um, people will find ways around it. Mm -hmm. And it's it happened in the past. If, Thank if, you. Uh, thanks. I would just like to add, uh, I did mention that in, the, in discussions, but we, did, we proposed, uh, because we think local content needs to be measured, and companies need to be certified or have certain point, uh, uh, points uh, to, in fact, even to distinguish who is really doing the effort for the local content, because you'll find JVs doing more for local content than local companies in some cases investing more, hiring more. So that needs to be accounted. And we had proposed a mechanism of uh, testing the, the local content where points will be given for each area. And in fact, we proposed that ownership would have a lot less points than management and using other companies. The one we gave more points, or we were proposing to give more points, was our, our, the, the number of companies you also subcontract that are local. That is because it spreads the work, it spreads the economy. So I agree, I agree with, the, it depends on the owners, but I think the management, and I've said that many times, should be a lot more important than owning the, the percentage or whatever percentage it is. So if I could just add one more. Uh, so another challenge with the ownership, and that's why Ghana did not go for the 51%, right? They, they just did a minimum of 10%. Uh, and we saw this in a lot of JVs. So if I am SLB, and I'm um, doing a JV with you, and you're supposed to bring 51% uh, of the share capital, and you know um, there is a lot of equipment involved and that involved, are you able to produce that 51% uh, equity? You see, that, that, that's another conversation that you may, you may need to have. So really, I, I agree with him, yeah, yeah, it's more of the management than the shareholding because that uh, and again, the shareholding can be done such that with uh, tax planning, they may never make a profit. And you may hold shares, but you may never make money. Yeah, so <laughs> shareholding is very tricky. It is indeed. And uh, if I can add to that point, just to what uh, Louis said, to make it clear, you can own a company 100% and you are local, but you will hire expats only. You will not buy equipment, but rent equipment from an international company. They will do the preparation, the maintenance of the job. And at the end of the day, you will keep a very small percentage of that profit because you will need to pay the expats abroad, you will need to pay the equipment abroad. So just discuss about ownership is not enough, and I think it's the wrong discussion. Yeah. What should be discussed is how much money is left in country. Because you can have a 0% local content company, but hires locals, spend money on local equipment and leaves the money here. So the ownership discussion is definitely not enough. Mm -hmm. It needs to be expanded beyond that. And I think that we had a lady with a question. And that will be the last one. Oh. Um, good morning, I'm Dapewa. Um, my question, or oh, actually two questions. Um, there's um, 
a number of people that are watching online, and um, like uh, the gentleman from All Fish Page said, the question is really, where do we go to sign up because we are ready or we want to be ready? Where do we go? And um, Charity shared um, her contact details, but I think it's important for people to know exactly who do they call, where do they go, where do they sign up, because that's what they, that's what I think a lot of us were hoping to see. I mean, it's good to get all the information and the learning from um, um, the companies that are in existence, whether in Namibia or outside, but people really want to know, where do I go? So that is the first one. The second one, um, the, I think uh, Olivia and Michelle um, have been mentioning standards. And I had a, a number of engagements with the NSI, that is the Namibia Standards Institution. And some of the standards we require, for example, in textile and garments, they are not in the country. We have to go to the South African Bureau of Standards. Um, I don't know if there's anybody from NSI here, but who will provide um, guidance in terms of the standards required for, um, for one to be ready? Thank you. Uh, okay, I, I think uh, if I have to go, um, the first one would then be um, definitely when it comes to Halliburton, we definitely uh, want to build up our ventilists. So um, in winter, I'm actually the contact person. I uh, would be able to, uh, maybe you can come and talk to me, because we're quite keen, uh, as I've explained earlier, we're quite qu uh, keen to uh, collaborate with uh, local um, uh, uh, manufacturers or um, vendors. So yes, and then um, the second one was about, um, oh, what was that about? Oh, international standards. I think it goes back to the uh, explanation that I gave that uh, it's, it's taking the local entity's hand and really, you know, um, explain as to what is necessary uh, for what you're supposed to be, uh, let's say, um, uh, producing or um, what we actually need from you. So don't feel alone. You're not going to be left alone. Uh, uh, Halliburton, when it comes to Halliburton, that's one of the things that we keen on doing. It's really definitely to make sure uh, that you are up to standard in terms of international standards, uh, because as, as I have explained earlier, uh, it's definitely a very risk um, uh, intense uh, industry that we need to make sure that we adhere to the uh, international uh, standards. So for that reason, we would not really want to collaborate with any vendor that is not up to standard. So, so I think that, that, that if there is a willingness, if there is a financial muscle from a, a vendor, we definitely, you know, also gonna be um, able to look, um, making sure that you up to scratch with, with international standards. I hope that answers um, your, your questions. And yeah. just to follow up on that question, one of the mandates of this conference is uh, actually to tell you that NCCI is where you go. NCCI and Antilla is where you go. Because that's exactly what they do. I mean, they collect the uh, information regarding the uh, SMEs that exist in country, mm -hmm. and they will provide a platform where the international service companies, the operators will come to ask questions, who are the Namibian countries that are the companies that are ready to provide this and this and this and this service. Okay. And that's where the uh, link will be done. Can we have a mic here, please? Thank you, George. I think you just answered the question more broadly. The, 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 the objective of us actually having initiated this conference is to make sure that we bring all the players together. Whether it's the oil companies, whether it's service providers, the trainers, whatever, you want to make it as a point of call where we want to actually understand what are the gaps that are required to be filled in. And we know who to work with and who to refer our vendors to with all the requirements that they would actually need as we prepare for this course and our industry. You heard already, government is not prepared to work with so many, you know, silos around. 
So obviously as a chamber, being the link between the private sector and government, that is why we initiated this particular conference. It's not just here and it's end here, we will have it every year. And one of the things that we would actually be monitoring really is how are these companies really complying with what they say they are doing. We should be able to say within a particular period, yes, we know every company, whether they have it within their policies, whether they have it within their procurement policies and their investment uh, plans, that they report also to this conference. We can be able to also have critical data, reliable data that says how has this actually industry impacted on our locals as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charity. George. There was a question from Mr. Knowledge as well. Yeah, but it's not really a question. It's just to touch on the issue of quality assurance as well as management systems. Um, why I'm touching on that specifically is the fact that um, there's a role that top management need to play. And when we're speaking about shareholding and all that, we should not look at it just as um, having interest in the company, but also the role that we Hello? which is actually part of the audit process. And I think Emmanuel can just give more clarity towards that so we can all understand. Because it's one thing to have the policies in place, have the documents for submission purposes, but then the implementation thereof is very important, especially when it comes to the ISOs. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. So just behind you, there's a lady. Good morning, Valencia Tivignani. I have a question for the chairperson of the chamber. Um, since we've been having discussions this morning talking about how standards are important on an international level as well as national level, I know that NSI in Namibia is basically the voice on standards for the different sectors. And early on in our discussions, it was very clear that we cannot just pull in one direction in terms of the oil and gas, but there are so many other um, industries that will have to get up and sit at the table in order to make sure that Namibia does not fall in the trap where it is not progressive or it's not moving to, to where we want to see it in the next uh, 20 to 50 years. So I'd just like to find out, in our prospect of being a part of this and everybody that has an interest or a voice is here, um, how prominent is the voice of the National Standards Institution in Namibia in terms of making sure that all the local companies coming up and the international companies are at one place and that it's, it's uh, correlated because yesterday, one of the questions I had for Namport was, uh, was it Namport, right? For Namport was, as a manufacturing company and as an upcoming company or a small um, business enterprise, she's competing against somebody they've probably been in business with for 15 years. How does she then ensure that they start to look at her now as a local entity and also grow with her as opposed to always having the example used that your quality is not what we require at this stage. I think uh, NSA is one of those partners that need to be at the table to guide the companies that are coming up and make sure that they are ISO accredited or they know how to get to that standard where international companies can look at them. I just want to know how, how, how far are we in conversations with them making sure that the Namibian companies know where to go knock or how they'll be guided. Thank you. You want to give some guidance on that or? I think she answered the question. Eh? Uh, charity, okay. Thank you. That's actually a very uh, good question. Um, remember that many of the oil companies, as they are now, they are, some of them are still exploration stage. There are still some pronouncements yet to be made as we go along the line. Hence, as a country, there is need a lot for preparation not only at policy level, but also at legislative framework as well. So that some of these things will also actually be accommodated and addressed in some of this legislation as well. So NSI is not just sitting there. Remember when it's a new industry, um, we don't set the requirements here as Namibia, for example. Yes, maybe for the service providers and all of that, but also we don't have the capacity, not that we don't have the capacity, we can develop the capacity, I believe, to just make sure that some of those compliance requirements for the suppliers and the vendors can actually be met. So then we have to develop then our own standards that also conform to those international standards as well. So as we go along the line, NSI is really one of the stakeholders that would actually be coming on board. So like I said, it's just the first of its kind. It's not 
ending here. We just started, and as we go along the way for every conference that you undertake, not just a conference, we will also be having in between probably, you know, business information sessions where we go along and see progression, what we are doing in the different parts of all this whole industry. I hope it answers the question. Thank you. So that will be the last question. Uh, we'll uh, have people that have to fly, so we'll have to close it here. I will just add one thing because there's a lot of mystery on where can we get the information. You just need to remember one thing. We are in the exploration phase. In the exploration phase, what the operators want to do is to drill, confirm if there is oil or not, and they want to do that in the fastest, cheapest possible way. So there won't be a lot of involvement uh, for, or, or for local companies at this stage. Mm -hmm. When the time comes, all these international companies will want to have proper services. And they will make sure that they communicate thoroughly exactly what they need and what they want. This is what happens. So there will be tender lists, there will be RFQs, and in those documents you will have all the requirements and everything that is needed to make sure that you uh, comply with the requirements. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. my panelists. And uh, what shall I say? <laughs> I was enjoying myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
oil and gas uh, law firm with offices in Windhoek, Namibia. Thank you. My name, my name is Eckhard Friedrich. Um, I run a, a consultancy called uh, Shepherd's Tree. So we advise uh, local and international clients uh, on navigating the local environment, um, doing a lot of work in the oil and gas industry, preparing projects, etc. And yeah, look forward to working with you all. Good morning, my name is Pablo Memba. I'm the CEO and Managing Director of Gmail, a uh, quarter Guinean -based, based company. We do management consulting, business development, uh, technical services, and um, I'm here to see if we, I can share my experience on the oil and gas business in Equatorial Guinea with my fellow friends and brothers from Namibia. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. So for the past two days, we've been discussing matters relating to policy amendment, um, financial assistance, as well as skills development. But one of the major things and very important issues that we'd like to obviously discuss today, and which was already the previous panel, is risk. And that's especially risk mitigation. And in an industry that's as complex as oil and gas, there's specifically risks relating to occupational health and safety, because you have employers that need to be transported to offshore um, facilities, but also will be working at offshore facilities that are very far away from any um, health facilities. And then you have the environmental risks, which relate to um, oil spillages and uh, <laughs> waste, like dealing with waste and atmospheric pollution. And this is very important to keep these in mind and really for Namibia to keep on addressing those. And what, how I would like to focus the discussion today is to really consider risk mitigation in two aspects. So firstly, it's the matter of how do local providers and local companies, what opportunities do they have in seeing the risk mitigation measures that other companies have to the IOCs, the, um, the producers have to implement, where can they come in and actually play a role? And then secondly, when they decide to actually come in and play that role, what are the risks that they themselves have to mitigate and have to be aware of because this is a very um, specialized industry? So with that, I would ask, like to ask Pablo the first question as our guest in this country. <laughs> so it is, how do you perceive the relationship between risk management uh, in the oil and gas industry and the promotion of local content within a country. Okay. I'm going to start uh, talking just from our experience of providing manpower to some of the companies where they are clients, specifically SLB. We provide to SLB several employees to go and perform work on the rigs on, in the ground. And one of the things where we always talk then, before they take off and go to the field, is they have to have a medical checkup. And then after having the medical checkup, then they will go and go to the field. But before getting to the field, we will have a safety and health meeting with them to tell them what to do, what not to do. They have to wear, have the PPA, and on, when they have the PPA, they should wear those PPA. They should not just go there and try to be cool like most young people they will do and not button all the shorts or not tie out the boots. So they have to go and obey what they have to be doing there and follow the safety and health uh, requirements where the clients need. And the government of Equatorial Guinea have clear um, laws and requirements where they give to every service company. And then those service companies, they tell us what we have to do as a local company where they're providing with the manpower or where we provide them with those services where they need. Thank you. So talking about laws that are in place and having a fellow lawyer on the panel with me is, Shafi, so in your view, what role can local content policies play 
in, in, in addressing and enabling local Namibians to really enter this market, specifically when it relates to risk mitigation? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, it is important to note that there's always been statutory recognition of uh, local content in Namibia, uh, because you, you look at it from the perspective of the constitution. I'm not gonna go much into detail, I'm just gonna give an overview. You look at it from the perspective of the constitution, you look at articles 10 and 23, which allows the Namibian constitution to enact legislations to, to, to support uh, previously disadvantaged people. And then you come to the specific sectors, to the specific regulatory framework that regulates the oil and gas industry. You have the Petroleum Act, you have the Model Petroleum Agreement, which uh, um, enhances local content, albeit it's qualified, because for example, you are required to give preference to qualified in, to, to employees who have the appropriate qualifications. You are required to, to procure services and goods and equipments from local companies on condition that those uh, goods and services are of a competitive of, are of a competitive nature. So there has been statutory recognition. And then going into detail from an HSE perspective, that's now the health, safety, and environmental perspective. Um, the, there are specific regulations that places obligations on operators to ensure that once they commence with operations, specific uh, mitigation factors are, 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 are put in place. So for example, when a well has to be drilled, uh, you have to first apply to the Petroleum Commissioner, uh, and when you prepare an application to the Petroleum Commissioner, you have to ensure that there is a oil spill and contingency plan which oil spill and contingency plan is basically an effective response on how to manage an event where there is an oil spill or where there is a fire. So from that perspective, it is important for local companies as well to acquaint themselves with the relevant legal framework governing the oil and gas sector because if you do not comply with those specific uh, regulatory frameworks and laws in place, it's a risk and international companies will unlikely be able to collaborate with local partners. So that's just in summary. Thank you. Thank you. From a practical point of view, what are the specific business um, opportunities? So what can you as a company do specifically in the occupational health and safety space to assist especially the IOCs? So from, from that perspective, um, you, you will have to look at the specific regulatory permits and approvals that need to be required. So for example, when you look at it from the Explosives Act, um, you are required to, to have specific permits that you must obtain. So as a local partner, you can mitigate that risk by ensuring that you apply for those specific permits. And when these uh, explosives are imported, uh, those specific imports, imports you as a local partner already have a storage facility to bring in those imports. Those storage facility complies with the specific prescribed regulations in the, in the laws on how those, specific, um, um, how those specific regulations are prescribed, the, the, the methods that must be in place. So that's from a more, a more practical perspective. Thank you. Eckhart. What are the opportunities are available for Namibians, specifically as it relates in the, more fin in the financial sector relating to risk mitigation? So here we're thinking insurance. You know, wh where can Namibians get involved? Yeah, I think there's, there's actually quite a lot and um, much more than, than you would typically think. So, so as an IOC or a op uh, operator or player in the oil and gas industry coming into a country you want to do a proper due diligence. So, so there could be an opportunity to provide those types of services, you know, um, do background checks. Um, typically, they're looking at level three due diligences and so on before partnering with, with anyone. Um, then there's, I mean, it's a, it's a very harsh and, and uh, you know, huge assets uh, out there. Uh, in a harsh environment, um, those need to be insured, and I think that's part of the reasons why there are th these stringent standards uh, that need to be adhered, uh, because 
only that way you can ensure certain activities. So there's a definite opportunity in that. Um, also certifications, etc. Every time a container needs to go out to, uh, to the rigs, it needs to be certified and checked. So, so this is a whole new um, industry actually that, that uh, is necessary um, to enable you know, the bigger mm. insurance type industries. And of course, you know, there's the, the typical uh, insurance uh, um, and hedging that, that we can think of in terms of currency, commodity risks, um, all of those types. And from the insurance point of view, considering some of the, the equipment and just how really expensive they are and the, the loss of production of any of them falling, def being defective for just even a day, are, are, are there insurance products on the market and how does even, will insurance, there will be sufficient Namibian insurers that will be able to cover that? Yeah, I'm not too sure if they exist in Namibia currently, but certainly in other jurisdictions, this has been an area where, where insurance companies have sort of localized that. It is fairly specialized, so, yeah. so you will probably need to get an international partner on board, mm. but certainly um, it, it has been um, done before. Okay. Oh, perfect, we'll have to see how, where that takes us. Pablo, from just almost some lessons learned from Equatorial Guinea. How successful have local companies been in really integrating themselves and providing those specific risk mitigation services to IOCs? So I'm thinking provision of safety induction courses, PPEs. How successful have they been in that regard and um, how have they capitalized on that opportunity? There are a lot of opportunities on the on this sector. And first of all, you have to, for example, in Equatorial Guinea, we have the Ministry of Mines and Hydrocarbon, and also we have the Ministry of Environmental. But the problem is sometimes those two ministries, one does not know what the other one is doing. But you have to get a certificate every year from the Ministry of Mines and Hydrocarbon to be able to operate in, in, on, the, on the sector. And once you get that uh, certificate, that will allow you to go and do work on the oil and gas sector. But the Ministry of uh, Environmental, sometimes they will come and ask you if you already have a certificate from their ministry because they're involved on everything related with environmental and health and safety. So there's, the, the opportunities are for example, on the waste management side. Because during the drilling, there's a lot of waste which being developed or is being created on the rigs. And those, we have to manage them properly. So the waste management is one of the opportunities where we see in Equatorial Guinea. And then we also see an, a, a, to provide other opportunities is to provide the PPAs. The PPAs, sometimes, some people they may think to have a PPA is just wearing the uniform and go to the rigs. But that, they have to be a specific type of PPAs. For example, I'm providing services to SLB right now, and every, for the past four to five years, every year or every six months, they always come back to me, Pablo, the PPA we you team is wearing right now, they did not meet all the requirements. I say, how can they not meet the requirement? We have been using this for the past six months. I say, no, because we have changed our requirements and you have to meet all those requirements. And then I will go and change and bring a, a different type of PPAs. And then after the, the six or one year, they will come again. We don't like this type of hats. So it's not only providing the PPAs, but we have to have the right PPAs for our team to go and work for our clients. And then, like I started saying, they have to have a medical checkup. For medical checkup, they can have it before going to the, to the rigs, 
And after uh, uh, 20 days, when they come back to the ground, they have to pass another, another medical checkout. And then they'll do uh, tests, random tests for drugs or alcohol or any kind of illness where they may have. If you have high blood pressure over 125, sometimes they will not allow you to board in and do the work. So there are a lot of work and services where they can be created and for the, this uh, uh, industry. Beyond that, I mean, the opportunities, especially in the, in the security space, as was mentioned very shortly also at the panel before, is providing um, the transportation because um, the IOC specifically have those um, requirements that um, their offshore workers, the workers that are here, they may not, at some, it depends on the jurisdiction, not be able to travel with public transport. So to provide those services and or even the creation of um, compound, like close compound living arrangements where they live and work and eat at the same place. So there's a lot of different opportunities there. So having addressed opportunities, I would then also like to just move over to the second part. It's about once you are in the industry, the, the risks, um, well, the risk mitigation measures that you specifically have to put in place and the, the risks that arise from the industry. So from the, obviously, the environmental perspective, we have the Environmental Management Act, we have specific legislation that provides for, it requires environmental clearance certificates to be obtained. Uh, there are a lot of shortcomings in the Environmental uh, Management Act, specifically as it relates to that environmental assessment practitioners don't have to be registered, so just ensuring the, um, you know, who are the people that are writing the environmental assessment, um, impact assessments. And from that perspective, having considered that there are some shortcomings in the environmental sector that would have to be addressed, from the occupational health and safety aspect, what are, Shafi, what are the, um, is it robust enough, our current occupational health and safety legislation and policies to specifically deal with oil and gas? Okay, to be honest, um, at, at, at this particular stage where we find ourselves in, um, it's not robust enough, but uh, bearing in mind, uh, um, considering the fact that uh, for the past 20 years, the, the objective of the petroleum sector was quite different. It was more from an exploration stage. You are trying to bring in investors and so forth. So um, at this particular stage, it's not robust enough uh, because one of the specific regulations um, that deal with health and safety is the 1991 regulations on health, safety, and the welfare and protection of the environmental uh, of the environment. So it places an obligation on on operators to to prepare specific emergency response plans and to obtain specific pollution certificates from the relevant regulators. Um, and in the event that uh, the operator doesn't do that, then the minister has the power to appoint uh, relevant expertise or relevant companies to, to, to ensure that um, the health and safety and environment uh, is protected. But uh, uh, obviously having had a background of, being, of working in the Ministry of Mines and Energy, at that stage we only had about um, six, seven petroleum inspectors. Now you are looking at it from the perspective of these six, seven petroleum inspectors have to ensure that there is compliance with the specific regulations under the downstream area, the downstream involves now inspecting service stations and so forth. And then they also have to ensure that all the offshore installations, the health and safety compliance is, 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 is adequate enough. So the capacity obviously at this stage is, is, is not of adequate and it's not robust enough to ensure that uh, operators uh, are complying with it. But uh, we are lucky enough having, uh, op having worked with uh, some clients who are international companies who have decided that notwithstanding the fact that uh, the laws currently are not robust enough, they have decided to adopt an approach which is industry's best practice. So they, 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 they consider having operated in developed countries with robust uh, legislative framework, they try to apply it to Namibia and ensure that uh, the, the health and safety is protected. So. From having that in mind and also bearing in mind that there is currently an ongoing process where the, the government is reviewing the current legislative framework 
to make it robust enough and to ensure that as we go on to the next stage from appraisal to development stage, we, we have a fit for purpose legislative framework. And that's a very important point that you mentioned in regards of that it is so important if you have the legislation and policies in place, if they're not improper, properly implemented or enforced and there is no policing, then the legislation, you know, it doesn't uh, really have that much in effect. And in that respect, it's really, there's a need to capacitate the, the regulators. So that's from the technical aspect, um, from the capacity of how many people there are, but also funding for them to even go to the places that they're supposed to be actually um, providing that monitoring services. And so Pablo, just one question I have also for you is, what advice do you have for local companies specifically as they're entering into this industry, specifically as it relates to their stringent health and safety requirements, and also just the, the unique nature of the industry? And before you answer, I mean, just one example is that even you might consider that you only have the stringent health and safety requirements or risks attached to if you have a business that relates to specifically working on the offshore platform or dealing with you know pipelines and so but just even a service like a catering in um, a catering service that provides catering to the offshore platform and at for some reason re um, results in food poisoning of the entire of all the staff on the platform can have massive financial risks and obviously implications because every day that um, platform isn't producing or operating, that's where the functional risk comes in. And then the local company itself could also be held accountable for that depending on how their contracts obviously have been set up. But then from just going back to the question, then from an occupational health and safety perspective, what are the lessons that you've learned and the tips that you can give to local companies? Oh, boy, I don't know where to start, <laughs> but um, for those who they want to start to get into with one of the businesses where we provide in, in Equatorial Guinea, where the demand of risk uh, mitigation and meeting all the requirements where they, not just the IOCs, but the service companies are demanding or requesting from us. First, you have to have a, a clear business plan. You have to understand what you want. You, you have to understand which your goals are. And then, once you develop your business plan, the business plan is not just have to be focused on, I want to make money. You have to know your market, where you want to focus on. And then you, you have to know which services you want to provide. Sometimes we always, in the beginning, asking, how can I start if I don't have the capital? I can I start if I don't know the business? And that's one thing. Most of those companies, this is no new for them when you tell them or you start talking to them about local content. Because local content is not start in Africa. Local content is started in Norway and UK and so on. And then in the US, for example, in Equatorial Guinea, most the IOCs and service companies are American companies. When you approach to them and you start talking to them, they will tell you that you don't have the experience. But then you can ask them, in the U.S., they have a minority a program called minority participation. Or well, minority participation, if you want to interpret that about what we're doing here or what we're talking about tonight or today about local content, it's almost the same thing. The minority participation, what it is, is every project will have to be developed in the U.S., financed by the government. You have to give some portion of the contract to minority or women-owned company. So once they start talking to you about lack of experience and you do not have the capital, you can mention that to them. You can also mention that to them, there's what they call it protege. 
The, what is the protege? The protege is mean a company like Schlumberger, Bacon Huge, Halliburton, and the others. They can take you to your arm and train you so you can reach certain level to be able to provide the services where they need. And then after you pass that stage, then you start preparing to get all the certificates necessary where you want or where the company need or where the government require. Once you get all those documents ready, you can start applying and providing services to them. But you have to have all the certificates, health, uh, health, insu uh, health insurance. You have to have all the certificate necessary to be able to provide services to that company. Without forgetting that you have to obey for, with the Foreign Correct Practice Act and the UK bribery law, because those are the anti-corruption laws where most companies are going to be asking if you want to provide services to them. And the most important for this panel is health insurance and also health and safety certificates. Now that we've discussed health and safety and environment for quite a bit, I would just like to also just move away over and discuss financial risks. Um, Eckhart. You need to okay. go. <laughs> <laughs> Please a hand of applause. <laughs> Okay, Eckert, on that note, um, can you provide us just an overview of the commercial and financial risks, especially, that any local company should just consider in entering as they enter the, local, um, the oil and gas industry? Yeah, I think those are the standard uh, risks. So, so you would look at, um, you know, if you're in an in infrastructure type environment, I mean, there's construction risk. Um, if you're looking at uh, um, you know, setting up uh, a business and looking for a loan, the bank is going to look at your credit risk. Mm. Um, then since you're going to be um, dealing with international companies, and you, you're working in a million dollars, um, and they probably in US dollars, there could be some currency risk that you need to be aware of. Um, and and so forth. So, but I think those are those are the main ones. Um, and obviously, your your own um, operational risks you would need to manage quite carefully on, on top of all of those. And so, Shafi, now having a look at this, the risks that have been mentioned, how can policies, or let's say, what policies and government programs can be set in place to address those financial risks that are faced. So the ones mentioned by Eckhart, but if there's any other ones. Um, okay, yeah, thank you for ahead. that. Um, so um, as, as emphasized during the, the local content, um, it, it, it's important to take note that um, the, the, the oil and gas industry is quite capital intensive and technologically driven. So um, if you have to take note that uh, um, from, from my background, having, having uh, um, specialized in the oil and gas sector, having obtained a master's in oil and gas law from the University of Aberdeen. There is normally a formation of partners who intend to develop a project. So let's say, for example, you have three or four partners. Um, within the four partners, you have 100% uh, interest. So each partner has 40, 40%, and then the local partner has, let's say, for example, 20% interest. Uh, in order to develop or to drill an exploration well means that that exploration well, at minimum, um, to drill an exploration well offshore Namibia will cost you around about 60 million US dollars. Um, it, it's, uh, and based on how joint operating agreements normally operate is that each party in the arrangement must contribute an amount of money proportionate to its interest. So you cannot at this stage expect a local partner to to, to to contribute around 20% of 60 million US dollars. So that's where the policy and the legal framework comes in to, to suggest um, 
concepts like carried interest, which is currently being practiced uh, in the industry, but it's not yet a regulatory requirement. So it is important that with the current review of the legislative framework, that we introduce this concept of carried interest, where the local partner will be carried to, 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 to fight that um, financial risk that are involved. So carried means that they will be carried, they will not be able to pay any expenses, they will not be able to pay any contributions in respect of the exploration wall, because that exploration wall might even be a dry well, and then that whole amount of money is gone. So from that perspective, uh, local partners can be carried to the effect that they do not contribute at any stage. And in addition to that, just looking at it from a service company's perspective, um, Operators need to enter into long-term contracts with service contractors and then operators will be required to provide supporting letters as well as contracts to enable these service companies and these local companies to obtain financing. Because when you go to a bank and you produce a, a, a contract, or a long-term contract or a letter of support uh, from an operator from an IOC indicating that we have entered into a this arrangement, we will be financing you for this specific time of money for this specific time of amount, then it's, it, it, is, it, it makes it easier for local partners to obtain financing. So it's just from that perspective that the, the legislative framework should be used to drive local content and enhance local content in Namibia. On the point of carried interest, is there a risk that's the, in, that would drive away the IOCs and investors from entering the countries if the the carried interest is just on such a level that it's not, for example, economical anymore? Yeah, I, I, I totally understand. There, there is a possibility, but having, uh, having worked in the industry for quite some time, um, in as much as it's not a regulatory requirement, you don't want your carried interest to be 20%. So at this stage, you would want a local partner to have probably a carried interest of 5% and an option to buy after production an additional interest. So currently, NAMCO has a 10% mandatory uh, participation interest. It's nowhere in the law, but it's a practice. Uh, most of the, the applications that are submitted, the ministry has advocated for scoring high companies who have an interest in, who have uh, local companies who, with a carry, who, who carry local partners with a minimum at least of 5% interest. So, Bearing in mind that there have been discoveries, bearing in mind that Namibia is having now coming to a stage where there is proven reserves, it's unlikely that uh, um, carrying a local partner for five to ten percent will drive them away. Thank you. So with that, I would like to take it to the floor. If there are any any questions, um, we have one over there. I assume that most of the people that had to catch the flight have left already, so we have time. <laughs> Mike, over there, please. May you please also then just state your name. And yeah. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, so my question is to both um, Mr. Shafimana and you, Mrs. Buch. Um, we all know that it is the duty of all stakeholders, including both community members and operators, to ensure the implementation and enforcement of this local content policy. My question simply put, is there a need for independent upstream regulatory body? Because as it currently stands, the Ministry of Mines, and I'm speaking under correction, is the regulatory body, instead, um, my apologies, in terms of upstream activities, um, they are the main player in assuring the enforcement and implementation of this local content policy, and they, are also the, and they also play the role of ensuring and providing the various licenses needed in upstream activities. Do you believe this best encapsulates the principles of good governance, um, adherence to the rule of law to be specific? And my follow-up question is, do you believe an independent regulatory body will be the solution in ensuring there will be no political meddling or corruption within the sector. Thank you. I'm not sure I got the question. It's incredibly difficult to hear the questions because the speakers are <laughs> to the front. Should I repeat? Yeah, please, and just maybe 
Just keep the mic the, yeah. a bit uh, far from oh. yourself. Yeah. So basically, the question is simply put, is there a need for an independent upstream regulatory body? And the follow-up question is, do you believe an independent upstream regulatory body will be the solution in ensuring there will be no political mainly or corruption within the sector? Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me take that one. Yeah, of course, look, um, we've, we've been advocating for an independent regulatory uh, body because um, if you look at other institutions that have, have, have successfully managed to, to develop their national resources, um, they have separated the policy makers, the commercial aspects as well as the regulatory aspects. So it is, it is an imperative and we do advocate for that and it is an objective that was set forth in the national energy policy of 2017, where there is a need to introduce an independent regulatory body which will have oversight and ensure the monitoring and compliance of these specific laws and everything and policy objectives that the ministry is putting in place are complied with. So I, I totally advance and advocate for an independent upstream regulator. We have done some brief articles which we have published in the newspapers on, on why it's necessary to have an independent upstream regulator. Thank you. Thank you. Over there, yes. Hi, just a quick one for Shafi on carried interest. If you could please um, elaborate on one, what, what is the incentive for uh, an international partner to carry a local partner when it's not in the law? So it makes sense for Namco, but for a smaller local partner, what's the incentive for them to carry somebody? And two, at what point does the local partner who's carried cash in, so to say. So what does, what does it look like for them to cash in on interest that has been carried when they're technically not contributing financially? Okay, thank you. So the, the incentives for, for carried interest at this stage is um, bearing in mind how the Ministry of Mines and Energy evaluates applications. Um, they certainly score high specific uh, companies who introduce local partners as, as carried interest. So Obviously, the, the first stage of the exploration period, um, that's, that's an area where you have a lot of expenditure. So there's not the likelihood of a local partner getting any form of benefit or income, but from production, because the carried interest is normally until production. And from production onwards, then the international oil company will be able to recapitulate um, a certain portion of amount that it spent on the expenses for that specific period of time. So if I just have to summarize in detail is to say that, look, if I'm going to carry you from exploration until development stage, I'm paying all your expenses, that's fine. From production, once we start to produce and there's a guaranteed income. So from that 5% interest that you have, I'm entitled to get back a specific amount, not obviously the whole amount, but just uh, based on a calculation on how I'm going to recuperate the, the specific amount that I've carried you during the exploration period. I, I hope I answer your question. Yeah. Perhaps I can also add to that. Um, so looking at it from a sort of joint venture type perspective, um, so, so carried interest is a good instrument to create alignment. So the more value the local partner also brings to the part, party, the bigger the pie, and the more likely that they will be able to share in it, um, recognizing, yes, they don't have the financial means up front, but they have the ability to create substantial value for the venture going forward. Okay, next question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, or is it good afternoon already? <laughs> uh, I am John A. from Nasria. Uh, you know, thank you so much uh, for the first time really highlighting the issue around the insurance. I think uh, for the past two days, I really felt that uh, we were left out, but uh, uh, thanks for the platform. Uh, well, I understand oil and gas is a specialized industry. Yes, Nasria is one of your public specialized insurance company uh, where I really want to touch is uh, do we or the current uh, 
legislative framework, does it really make a provision for the insurance industry uh, to at least get uh, the right of first uh, of refusal? Uh, because well, what is really happening at the moment is there is the influx into the market by foreign uh, insurance and reinsurance company. Uh, although the, the, the same reality really is around, uh, we, we, we may not have capacity like what Shafimana have just indicated that the, the exploration can be something that goes to an extent of uh, 16 billion US, and if you look at our GDP as a country, maybe equivalent to that or lesser than that, then that really speaks to that as a country we may not have uh, the capacity. But then the question really, or the point really is about what is that we have in the current legislative framework that that can really support and strengthen the local insurance uh, players so that they can participate, which, which is really, to me, is, 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 is the theme of this conference, the theme of this conference, because if, if you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking about uh, a legislative framework uh, that, that somehow compel even the foreign insurance player to, to really collaborate with the, the local uh, insurance company. So, so, so that we, we can perhaps also uh, inform well the local content policy, which is in draft, so that uh, at least those provisions can be, can be made. So it's, it's just basically to say if, if there is anything that compels uh, with anticipation of really strengthening the mm. local insurance industry. Thank you so much. Um, okay, look, from, from, from my knowledge at this stage, because um, um, we are venturing into the insurance uh, sp um, space now, um, at this stage I'm not aware of any specific regulatory framework or, or legislative framework that compels insurance companies to invest or support local companies. Uh, but that's obviously something that should be considered upon, and um, that can only be done through com through effective stakeholder engagements, where you have um, regulatory bodies such as NAMFISA and industry players uh, partaking in such discussions to see how they can play a role in fostering and ensuring the local partners have a role or are supported through uh, financing. So, from from my perspective, at this stage, I'm not aware of such. And also just, yeah, just to add to that, that that's really where the local content policy will play a very big role. Because the local content policy, you can discuss procurement, ownership, employees, but it also does related services. So um, it can include then, once it's, you know, they can include requirements specifically relating to banks, insurance, even lawyers. Um, and if I think it is in Nigeria where they have specific local content requirements also for those industries. So I don't know, is it last yesterday afternoon the Minister of Mines and Energy did come and give a surprise visit and he really encouraged everybody to submit any concerns or suggestions they have um, in relation because in relation to the draft local content policy because it is that, it is still a draft. So I would suggest that perhaps as an industry you come together and address something to him in that regard. Okay, hey, and there's another question over there. Okay. Right, my name is Linda Shanika, and I represent a company, electrical construction company called Ladenko Construction Namibia. Uh, my question or my question, it's a question suggestion, I think, uh, is that I, I want to build upon the uh, issue which was raised yesterday, 
I think it was by Dr. Umati and, and Pisha from Bank of Namibia. And it was also uh, amplified in, by Dr. Hangala yesterday uh, during the gala dinner regarding the uh, local content policy for other industries other than just oil and gas. Uh, my question is that, uh, before I maybe uh, offer my suggestion, is that is it possible then to finalize maybe the local content policy for the oil and gas, which can be a blueprint for other local content policy? Because if you look at the objectives, I want to believe that they will be applicable to all other industries. And maybe it's just uh, some details that are more specific to various or to specific industries. If, for example, you look at uh, mining, uh, oil and gas, and, and maybe, yeah. If you, look at, if you talk about, for example, technical skills, if they need an electrician, it's just an electrician. But of course, as maybe the Petroleum Commissioner said yesterday, is that the compliance issues maybe in the oil and gas industry might be different from the compliance issue maybe in mining. Hence, you might uh, find that uh, electricians maybe that will be working in oil and gas will be required to do a certain uh, uh, or specific course that will maybe allow them to to, to do, to perform the work. My question then comes to, if we can have these uh, uh, local content policies that are for every industry, is it then possible legally to be, by the stage that we find ourselves wanting to come up with the legislation as that is the main, or the end uh, game, or aim rather, is to say, if we can have these various policies, is it possibly legally to have then one umbrella legal, I mean law, that will govern these various policies? Because for me, the objectives are the same. I don't know whether it's legally possible or it's only possible where, for example, the law, um, the, you can only have a policy, for example, that talks to petroleum, and then we have the law and the policy. Or you can say, we can have a, a general policy that talk up to local content, but we have various policies under that law. Possibly, I don't know whether it's legally possible, but my question and suggestion kind of is that. I don't know whether I made myself clear on that. Did I? Yes, you did. <laughs> Do you want to address that or should I? Okay. Let, me, let me try at first and um, I, 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 I acknowledge the fact that, yes, um, you, you, you would want to seek a situation where you have an umbrella of local content policy speaking to the different sectors um, in, the, in the industry. But we, we, we must also take into consideration that when it comes to the, the, the technical or the specific work that needs to be done, it's, it's quite different because for, for mining, for you to do pro, um, exploration to do for you to do um, to, for you to get an exploration prospecting license uh, there's a specific type of work that you do that is unrelated to a petroleum exploration licenses so the work that you conduct under the petroleum legal framework and the work that you conduct under the mining framework obviously uh, is, is quite different hence why it's necessary to to have specific policies that speak to 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 that specific regulatory framework because what you want to do is you want to align your policy to your legislative framework. You don't want a situation where your policy and legislative framework speaks differently. But uh, just to summarize and also to, by having due regard to the local content policy in its draft form, there is the, the intention to align the local content policy to other policies such as the Vision 2030 policy, the Harambe Prosperity Plan, the national, the national energy policy, there is that strategy to align them and see where they can align each other, but to have them under one umbrella body might not be so sufficient because of how the industries operate differently. Mm. Yeah, maybe to add if anyone else. 
Yes, no, I mean, I also um, agree with uh, the sentiments there. So obviously one could prepare it like that. It's a matter of thinking if it is the most effective way also, and would it create certainty? Another issue is that if you regulate local content of all industries within one act, you're really stepping on the toes, like every minister's gonna step on each other's toes because there's ministers that deal with specific sectors. So if you say, for example, it would be the Minister of Industrialization and Trade that then is in charge of that regulation, he would be making decisions on behalf of a different ministry, such as fisheries, that knows its sector and really knows what it is correct in it. So I think it's, it would have to always be sector specific. And another important consideration also is that if you have a local content policy that relates to every single sector, where are all the, where are all the Namibians gonna come from? Because we're already um, thinking about in the, if you have petroleum and green hydrogen at the same time, um, there's concerns that is there even enough Namibian service providers, employees to service those industries? So if you create local content requirements across the board to all the sectors um, right now, maybe later, but um, right now that they just might not be the amount of people to actually deal with it. Okay. So I don't know if there's a, I think we can take one last question and then we would have to, there's a question and then we have to move on. Okay. Um. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Yeshua. I'm based with a local insurer, also Nasria. Just also, uh, what I want to say is basically it's a, both a comment and an answer. Uh, basically, um, sorry, uh, what I wanted to say is I have both a question and a suggestion which maybe is open for comment. Uh, basically, on the question of uh, Mr. John A., who, who spoke about the insurance sector and whether the insurance sector in Namibia has capacity to underwrite the risks that are especially in respect of the oil and gas sector, which are, the risks are significant. Uh, I think it's necessary to clarify that, this, you know, even though the risk might be big, uh, in terms of the local legislation, there is already a requirement that the risks, insurance risks, have to be offered to the local market, and only in those instances where the local market is un unable to, to take it up, then those risks are taken outside of the country. But I'm not sure what is happening right now with the, with the oil and gas sector, um, especially since it's still at its infancy, because perhaps there might be instances where some of these insurance companies are being, uh, basically because they are part of larger groups, and maybe their risks are being underwritten uh, internationally as part of the parent company. But in terms of the local legislation, actually that would not be lawful. The, the option needs to be made that uh, to the local insurance market that no, we've got this risk, can you take it up? If not, then you then you then you outsource because some of the risks, as much as it's yes, some of the risks might be worth several billions of dollars, but there are also smaller risks that could be taken up by the local market. So it is necessary that um, the lo the oil and gas sector is aware of that. In addition to that, even if let's say it's a risk of as 16 billion, as was mentioned, U.S. dollars, uh, the local sector might not be able to underwrite that risk. But the local insurance companies can still underwrite, let's say, 100 million of that risk. So that option should be there, that it's offered that the local sector underwrites a portion of it in order to build capacity and also to limit uh, the capital outflow within the, the sector in uh, Namibia. And that is also, uh, I think that is also a similar suggestion for the, even the other sectors that are, the other support sectors that might want to service the oil and gas industry where maybe uh, they might not be fully able to uh, take on the entire support that to, they might not be able to fully offer the support that might be required to the oil and gas companies, but the option should be made that, okay, for this specific uh, portion, maybe we can, you can support us with this, and then beyond that, you can now seek um, um, ser the services of foreign entities. It's something that we really need to, to, to look into because there are local entities that can support the various, uh, service, uh, the various needs of the oil and gas sector. It might not be at the full scale, but at least a portion of that should be offered to the local sector. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Isha. Um, I'm, I align to your to your comments. And just to clarify, it was 60 million US dollars, not billion. 60 million US <laughs> dollars. Yeah. Thank you so much for that um, very insightful comment. It's really, as you said, it's almost it is the low-hanging fruit that can be can be really serviced. Mm. 
Um, it doesn't always have to be to the full extent, and that's why where the local content policies come in place to really see how, what ability Namibians have, how we can meet that ability, and then to move forward from that. And on that note, uh, I would like to... Oh, Eckhart has a yeah. quick yeah, Maybe comment? just to add to that, um, I think what, what you're probably going to see is that the rule book will change quite a lot once you go from exploration and appraisal to production. So then we, we're looking at a sort of 10, 20, 30 year sort of camp production campaign. Yeah. And um, usually as part of the production licenses, um, there is a clause in there also that says if there's a service offering that can be delivered locally to the required standards, um, the operator will have to use the local um, option. So yeah. that's typically what's what's in there. And yeah. I think right now it's it's probably just very short-lived, you know, drill a, a few wells, um, <laughs> see, evaluate. But I think once we get to that stage, it will certainly make sense to invest some more time and energy in, in really bottoming out those opportunities. Perfect. Then, well, I just want to thank my panelists, the one that's most probably already in the air. Um, thank them for their very insightful comments. And yes, and thank you for the audience for your attention. <laughs>
Old Mutual and have those ones played because these are the partners and part of the promises uh, that were made to them by the organizer. So we can have that before we get to the presentation. That brings hope, joy, progress, and change in Namibia. We have committed to doing great things every day to impact economic prosperity. At the Old Mutual Foundation, our mission is clear to create sustainable change through our three pillars, which focus on education and skills development, financial well-being, and community development to drive positive transformation, touching the lives of our Namibian communities. As an integral part of the Namibian fabric, we at the Old Mutual Foundation are anchored deeply in our communities and believe every good deed will yield a bright future. Because Johannes Bakare, no, I don't my good unless my, except bad dark if I may Old Mutual Foundation for me, I help us. My name is Diana Nakumba. I'm here to thank Old Mutual Foundation for funding my Embegem business. They love Embegem. Thank you very much. Hey there, Old Mutual Foundation. I'm Jason. Thank you so much for the impactful experience. It has added value in the immediate community in which we operate in. By uniting under the banner of the Old Mutual Foundation, we're not just shaping a better today, but also paving the way for generations to come. Uh, Norid uh, Electricity uh, operates within the ESI industry um, as licensed by the regulator. We are a distributor and we distribute and supply electricity. We cover about eight regions in the northern part of the country, that is namely from Opuo all the way to Zambezi region. For us, being a rural-based supplier, communication is key and the leveraging of technology is the easiest and cheapest and most effective way for us to reach our customers. And uh, it is very, very important to have good connectivity. We've had several service providers and their, their main challenge has always been that the size of our network and it makes it difficult to deliver the correct quality to us in terms of uptime, in terms of uh, mean time between failure and all these various issues. Uh, MTC has been able to come on board and uh, really deliver to us and we can really see a massive uh, difference in terms of uh, failures. So we, we really have been able to benefit from this partnership in terms of uh, quality of service, uptime, the things that really matter to, to our customers and also at the correct price point. For us, every time we have a downtime, it's money. Our customers cannot buy, we can't serve our customers. People cannot buy electricity, they can't do anything. I, cash flow is affected, especially the prepaid uh, sales. So um, when every second that we are up affects our bottom line. So it has been a very good choice to, to work with MTC on some of these things. MTC, always so proud, always represents us so well. You can clap, huh? <laughs> uh, nonetheless, we will, of course, avail. I think there was a question also around the presentations, whether you can get a hold of those, etc., etc. All of that will be available on the Antilla website. Of course, we know with presentations, usually at conferences, there's also the issue around copyright. Some want to share, others don't want to share. So once that has been cleared up, you will be able to get a hold of the presentations on the website of Antilla. So for the last three days, we've been discussing local content. The big question, of course, now is what are the key outcomes and recommendations? So please welcome Ms. Annette Stienkam, the Executive Director of the Ministry of Education, just to give us some of those key outcomes and the way forward. A round of applause for her, please. Thank you very much. Esteemed ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And thank you for your tenacity to remain. I think the two and a half days has been absolutely amazing. And each and every one of us 
will attach a specific value and a specific experience that we're taking back with us. I saw a lot of videos being taken. I saw a lot of recordings being made, a lot of notes. Some of us still believe in pen and paper that don't get a virus. Others use the technology. But everybody, in essence, captured what they found valuable. And I, from the onset, wish to thank the NCCI and Antilla Consultancy, everybody, all the main sponsors that have been such a great part of this first ever Namibia Local Content Conference. There were four specific objectives. And before I go to those four, I, I had to pull this. If you think back of COVID-19, and you now think of the oil and gas industry, what do they have in common? The word unprecedented and opportunities. Isn't that correct? So if you look back on the two and a half days, how many times did you hear the word opportunities? I think some of us stopped counting. So the four objectives was first and foremost to identify opportunities. Secondly, to have in-depth and insightful discussions and informative discussions um, among Namibians and international guests on the oil and gas value chain. Also, to enhance the visibility of opportunities for Namibians and to minimize the information asymmetry. And I think if we, if we look at the theme empowering Namibia's energy ambitions by connecting industries and indigenous talent, then you need to give yourself a round of applause as a delegate, as a speaker, as an expert, as a specialist, as a layperson like me who came and we learn and we are having our takeaways. I think, and, I, and you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that this conference was a resounding success. There were specific interventions proposed. Now, I wish to state from the onset that this will still be concretized, and then it will be shared in a final report with you. However, every one of you know what you are taking away. Everybody know what it is that they want to go and focus on. And you have to do that unpacking yourself. There's an abridged version of these interventions that are proposed. First and foremost, there is an urgent need for the development of blueprints and the crafting of implementation plans and of course the roadmaps for the oil and gas sector. The recommendations for this action plan would need to see Namibia establishing clear timelines for the sake of accountability and to track the progress effectively. That's the first one. Secondly, we need to foster on highly skilled careers. This sounds very easy, but we need to understand that this recommendation underscore the importance in the education sector for minor curriculum reviews to align with industry needs and ensuring that the citizens are equipped with the relevant knowledge and skills. And this is where, as an executive director for the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture, I wish to call on all our external stakeholders and everybody present here, please do an external audit on our curriculum. Identify the topics and the themes that we are already covering because to a great extent, energy, renewable and non-renewable, wind, solar, power, everything is already covered. But to which extent and depth do we now need to identify other specific topics and concepts that must still be integrated into the curriculum? And we are now busy with a minor review of our curriculums. 
and there's sufficient time for us to get this right as a collective. Secondly, still under this point, we need to invest at the right level. We cannot wait as an industry in the oil and gas sector to only invest in technical and vocational training when the time comes. You need to start investing already in early childhood education, pre-primary up to advanced subsidiary level, grade 12. We need to get that right. And the danger and the inaction if we don't invest correctly, will come back to haunt us. So highly skilled careers must be fostered. Thirdly, there is a need to create a supply chain, supply value chain for local participation. Extensively, it has been discussed about procurement, subcontracting and service provision, and offering the avenues for local entrepreneurs to grow and contribute to the industry's success without inhibiting, without preventing them to enter this market because of experience. And I think one of the key issues that came out over and over was that everybody is encouraged to form joint ventures or partnerships with local companies to, en to ensure that many Namibians and all Namibians actually benefit from the resources. Hyphen was mentioned as one of the key examples that last, last year launched the socio-economic development framework, and I think we can take a leave from them. The NCCI, remember, working on a centralized na national vendor database with the aim to promote the accessibility of local businesses to industry operators and international service companies. And that's something that we should make sure that, that those are truly in place. Capacity development initiative. Recommendations here centered around the need for capacity development initiatives to enhance the skills and the capabilities of the Namibians to meet the demands in the oil gas sector. I think we talk about that already in terms of training programs, educational partnerships and skills development initiatives that are highly essential components for empowering local talent. Ladies and gentlemen, there was furthermore the issue of policy framework and regulation and in-depth discussion as to the weight between policies and laws and delegates really in a robust manner discussed issues around policy frameworks and regulatory environment to support the growth of local content in the oil and gas sector. The recommendation here includes measures to promote local participation while enforcing compliance and ensuring transparency and fairness in the procurement process. An effective Legislation as opposed to a policy should be in place. That was made very clear. The how and the when this will be attended to, something that must still be mapped out. Investment creation. Delegates really explored the avenues for investment, knowledge, skills, and technology transfer, and of course, knowledge sharing in order to accelerate the development of the industry while fostering sustainable growth. I think all of you may recall one of the slides, it was in blue, where it talks about non-specialist jobs, specialist jobs, and highly skilled specialist jobs. The opportunities for Namibians in the oil and gas industry, it has been made the points that we need to look at the low-hanging fruit and the low-hanging jobs. What are these? transport, logistics, waste management, fuel suppliers, accommodation, custom clearance, catering accommodation, and medical services, officer supplies, warehousing, unskilled or semi-skilled jobs among some. I wish to add here that we should not short sell ourselves. We should not limit ourselves. 
Everybody know at which phase we are right now. It's been said over and over. However, we've got still many years in the long run to prepare and to invest in training and get it right. The ultimate goal for us as Namibians, we have to see how best do we foster Namibian expertise while being appreciative of the international specialist and how can we learn from each other and become less reliant. That is of critical importance that we harmonize and find a balance in the long run in terms of fostering and building local skills with our international partners. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, there are percentages given in terms of Namibia's success rate. 86% success rate in terms of exploration compared to the global average of 30%. Namibia's oil discoveries offshore are progressing at a rapid rate. There comes the word, unprecedented rate, actually. Can you give us a round of applause? <laughs> now is the opportunity for wealth creation. It's not something that we should take lightly. In wealth creation and breaking down the barriers of poverty, abject poverty, requires strong work ethics. It requires integrity. It requires accountability. It requires strength and faith in ourselves and pride in who we are as a people, as a united Namibian nation. We should not forget this, ladies and gentlemen. We have the opportunity to create wealth. How will we spend that wealth that we are creating? What will we do to make impactful changes and have a positive influence in the lives of the Namibian child? There were only four speakers over the two and a half days that mentioned the Namibian child. Whatever decisions we take and whatever action plans we are going to implement, as Ms. Charity said this morning, you have to remember that we all work towards the upliftment, the inclusivity in the diversity aspect of the Namibian child. And therefore, you will agree with me that this conference truly served as a catalyst where we all foster collaboration and promote local content development and discussions with the aim to empower Namibians to harness its energy ambitions through effective industry engagements and indigenous talent utilization. Indeed, we've heard that government has undertaken the initiative of a local content policy to provide for a framework that seeks to optimize and maximize the benefits that is presented in this industry by enabling and promoting local content along with the value chain of natural resourcing, mining activities. And through this policy, government aims to develop the various linkages that are needed of local industries to these emerging sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, true conclusion, this gathering agreed that Namibia's energy sector is truly built on the principles of sustainability, diversity, inclusivity, and a shared prosperity. You know, there's a saying that trees never meet, but people do. We'll meet again, and we'll need to take stock of what it is that we've committed ourselves to do at this very conference for the interest of the Namibian people. And lastly, I wish you to turn to the person on your left, make eye contact, and just say, I appreciate you. I thank you.
Ms. Anetsky and come. Thank you very much uh, for that as well. Those small things really make a difference. It just changes the energy uh, in the room as well. Long time public servant, uh, someone who's dedicated, of course, her life to serving the Namibian child, it's even being a director in the Ohangwena region. She has worked in most parts of the country, of course, until she finally got the responsibilities at head office as the executive director. Partnerships are what makes things work. Collaborations are what makes things function. I'd just like to call on the CEO of NCCI, Ms. Charity Muya, to give us some closing remarks uh, before we do the vote of things. A round of applause for please. I'm not doing the closing remarks. I think uh, I've spoken a lot, so I just want to leave it to my little sister to do the closing remarks. But I think in conclusion, just to conclude, I think it's been a very productive three days, right? Thank you. I think um, they say information is power. And for us, really, this was really to create this platform for you to make sure that you get as much information as possible. And we facilitate the dialogue. We facilitate the interventions that are required as we prepare for this new economic boom. But like I said in my presentation, the focus is really not just on the oil industry, but exactly what are the ripple effects that this new economy is bringing to us. And that should really be the major focus. When you're talking about local content as a chamber, we will be in the next month also be looking at local content in the maritime and fishing industry, local content in the financial service sector, and so forth. So I would like to humbly and maybe announce to you that from the 1st to the 6th of July, this year, we will be hosting our Sokopon International Trade Expo. It normally happens annually in Sokopon, usually in October. But because this year is an election year, we know that that time is going to be very busy. So we've moved it to actually July. It will happen immediately after the AVDEF, is the aviation um, event that is, Namibia is also hosting immediately after that. Um, in Swagopmond as well. So please, um, these are also platforms that we're creating for you to get as much information. We'll be also focusing business sessions that will be focused on the maritime industry as well, local content in the maritime industry. So concurrently, as I indicated, it's for us to really prepare ourselves that these billions that are potentially coming to our you know, economic basket what other opportunities are we trying to actually um, open up to support all the other industries? Um, Ludris, you have been very, very warm at heart, not with the weather, but at heart, in welcoming us here. But I think you should also be very prepared with the many activities that are coming on this ground. Already I'm informed, I think, in the next few weeks, I mean, next week you've got the Crayfish Festival, and then afterwards, again, there's another event that is happening there. What does that really mean for the rural community? It means you have to be very, very prepared on the opportunities that are coming there, whether it's accommodation establishments, whether it's um, all the other services that you're able to provide in here. It's really, really an economic boom. But as I indicated, importantly, it's for us as Namibian to prepare ourselves on how we can work together. In the private sector, the formalization or the forming of partnerships, very, very critical. I want to tell you a certain uh, experience that I had on one of the trade missions that we undertook to one of the Asian countries a few years back. Some of the companies at the cost decided to support a few SMEs. They sponsored their travel so that they can also get the exposure. Those are some of the corporate companies that we really give credit to when they really support our small businesses. 
So we went to China, and during the engagements, the B2B sessions, Namibian businesses actually came back and said, look, I went to China to look for a partner, but during the B2B sessions, my partner that I got there was actually a Namibian. So we didn't need to really go all the way to China. My partner, I didn't know because there was no platform for me to, a platform for us to actually engage. I was able to get my partner there. So one of the interventions we are doing as a chamber is to start getting business groups where we take you for exposures to other regions. For example, we say we're going to have exposure visits to the Zambezi region. You may have the oil money, but you're not, you don't have enough land to put up a lot of infrastructure to support your other businesses. Maybe your partner is in Katima, has land, and you want to put up a logistics hub, for example, since that's a logistic whatever. So those are the kind of interlinkages that we are trying to create as a chamber. Importantly as well, please, if you had not yet registered, make sure that you give us all your details properly so that we put you on our database. It's not that I'm telling you that you're gonna get a tender tomorrow and whatever. We're not into, we want to build entrepreneurs, not just entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs. So that the opportunities that are coming, with all the connections that we have with other sister chambers around the world, around the globe, we can be able to connect you to that. Very soon we will be launching the South Africa Namibia Business Council. Many of you know last year we had the South African Namibia Business Forum where our two heads of state actually um, you know, addressed us. And one of the outcomes from there was that the two business communities of the sister countries must formalize a business council. Because as you know, over the years, our trade with South Africa is very skewed in support of South Africa. More South African companies are operating in here, in the Namibian land. But how many of Namibian companies have actually made inroads in the South African market, as an example? Or how much of our Namibian products are we seeing in the retail stores, that, of South African retail stores that are actually operating here? So it's a whole scope. Let's not just be looking. The oil is coming, is bringing the revenue, but how are we going to utilize that revenue? For all those that are coming from the other local authorities, it's not just Ludris. It will require that we have the right civil servants, we write the right local authority officials that must be working in these offices. Dr. Hangala yesterday highlighted to that. When you are serving, an investor wants to see your turnaround time in terms of how you serve them, how you respond to them, provision of land, of services, and how competitive are you. And as a chamber, we are going to also start an assessment where we reward also recognition or recognize those local authorities that are performing well because that's the only way we can also make you very competitive. I think the private sector would like to hear that. So um, I don't know, I have not seen my brother, Mr. Flaxman Samuel. He's an example of a real hardworking Namibian. We know the history here. We know the history here. He's been very passionate. There is no way in the history of, the, of Ludris or Ludris history that you would actually profile the history of Ludris from this current generation where you don't have Fluxman Samuel's name in. So we want to see many of the Fluxman Samuel's in other local authorities as well. But what is important is really the partnerships that we need to actually form. We know politics is there. It's good to have you know, people in opposition because they, take, they put us on our feet. Uh, but for young people, I know it's also good to be in politics. But you are the economic drivers. We have seen the statistics. Namibian population is made up of a young population. So you fall mostly in the 70, this is the 71%. And this 71%, when we are talking about even the African Agenda 2063, it's not for us. The Agenda 2063 is actually for your grandchildren. So what are you doing now to make sure that in 60 years' time, we don't say our forefathers, because you'll be ancestors then, they made these laws for us that we can't come out of. We have to make the choice and make the right choice, the right decisions now, collectively as Namibians not as Southerners, not as Easterners, but 
as Namibians. One of the things that I will try to actually advocate for, for those ones that are into politics probably, I always say that maybe we didn't do too well when it comes to re Namibianization. I'm a child of one of the returnees. Of course, we had to come back, you know. So one of the countries where I went to, there was really nationalization, which meant that they have the upper primary school, you're in grade seven, you have to write a national exam to go to secondary school. So when you're writing that national exam, you have to choose three different secondary schools that you have to apply for so that when you pass your grade seven, you can go to any of those schools. So as an example, to just give the face in Namibia. So if I was from the Zambezi region, I'm in grade seven. I'll apply to one school in the Zambezi. I'll apply to one school in Kate Mansop, one school in Vindok. There is a pass rate, an average pass rate. So if you meet that average, maybe by your choices, you go to any of these schools. However, if you performed high and you are in the A or B students, automatically the nation will send you to one of the top performing schools, like a private school, whatever, automatically. So what that meant is that that child had an opportunity, even from a poor background, provided you performed, you had an opportunity to go to a better school. So my sister, Ms. Tenkam, these are the things we should also be looking at. So that the child who's from Titsabase, who's from ours, does not actually have to depend on making sure that they have money and all the money to go to St. Paul's, to go to St. George's. By virtue of their capabilities, they must be provided that opportunity to go to the best school in this country. All these things that we have spoken out, I've already said, they will not happen if we don't skill our people from the foundation, as we have said that. That foundation is key. The economies that have happened there is because they've educated their people. Secondly, supporting Namibian businesses. It doesn't matter whether the difference is $100, is $1,000, the money circulates in the economy. It provides job opportunities for Namibians in the economy. We must learn to do that. All these economies that have made inroads in the other economies were supported by their own people. So local content is not just about looking at government providing those pro opportunities, but we as Namibians, how are we supporting each other to make it actually really happen? So thank you once again to all of you that have been very participatory here. Don't forget to make sure that you sign up you sign up to be a chamber member. It's not the money that I want, it's the capacity and the, the capacitating of you and provision of opportunities for you and for you to participate in the policy making. Special economic zone policies consultations are taking place. National Planning Commission NDP6 consultations are taking place. Local content, the diamond bill, all these are taking place. Where is your voice as a private sector? It's going to only happen when you actually come in an institution that is very well recognized like the Chamber of Commerce. So I think I want to thank you so much all for your participation. We'll be available, obviously, for the rest of the day to network and engage more. But please, as I said, it is time for Namibia, particularly, the ghost town of Ludris, let us make it the miracle of Ludris, as was the miracle with South Korea. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mia. Indeed, it takes a village to raise a child. And of course, uh, this baby that we call the local content conference uh, was birthed by hers truly, Maria Moody. Let's give her a platform to just say her vote of thanks uh, for today. Round of applause, sir, please. So, you don't, you don't need to be held to this? No, no, sorry. Oh, okay. Got this now. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for still being here. I know a three day conference is always taxing and daunting um, experience, but yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say a few things that um, I think were very important to mention and that I would like to leave you all with before you leave, please. 
There are three main things that I wanted to achieve with this conference. Um, and I believe that perhaps we might have achieved them together this week. Number one, I wanted us to have a platform um, where we could all congregate and talk about critical things that really matter right now. Number one, we need to define what Namibian local content is to us. It should not be something that is a stencil or something that we, we take from other people. Yes, we can look for um, inspiration from other people, but it should be something that we define ourselves. So, for example, what do we actually mean when we say a Namibian company? Do we mean a locally registered company? Or do we mean a company that is actually being owned by indigenous Namibian people? People that were born here, or people that have contributed to our, to our advancement over the years. What are the implications of the latter? What are the implications of the latter? And should we perhaps put some parameters in place to ensure that the former benefits us? So if we say that it's a Namibian company and we allow for the registration to be Namibian and the ownership perhaps is not, um, is that good? Maybe yes, it contributes to GDP still. And earlier today in the panel discussions, it was actually brought up to say, sometimes it's not all about ownership. The 51% could just be 51%, just a number. But the actual influence, the actual impact is actually in the management of the company. So that is, those are the things that we all need to sort of understand. And the point is that we should start having these conversations in one setting so that we can also, you know, have more transparent conversations around local content, around our future. Everyone has a voice. Everyone has a contribution to make. Whether, it doesn't matter your creed, doesn't matter your race. I feel like as Namibians, we all have the desire to, to be pride, proud Namibians. I think we love our country. We love our people. And this week it was evident. Mm? I think once we then also um, have an understanding of what the value chain looks like or where we all can play a role, then we can actually add value. So I think we are all as stakeholders and different institutions and players in the industry, we're all working for a better Namibia, right? We're all working to ensure that these resources that are Namibian resources are actually being kept and um, beneficial to all Namibians, right? So at the top there, I wanted to showcase the regulators, Ministry of Mines and Energy, NAMCOR, and various others that play a role in that part. Towards the, what side is this? Is this left? Yes, the side. You have NIPDB and platforms such as the International Energy Conference. Those have a more macro um, throwing or uh, catchment, right? They go and they do uh, promotion or marketing for FDI, you know, foreign direct investment. So their audience is obviously international people which is very, very crucial, you know. A lot of people, like people like Ms. Maggie Shino and previous commissioners, they've spent a lot of years marketing Namibia to be an attractive investment destination when it came to um, exploration work, right? Those platforms are important. But then now we come to the right side, NCCI, and then obviously a platform like um, the NLCC where the voice of the people should be heard, a platform where what they foresee, what they envision to be a better Namibia is heard and captured, and it should be independently anchored by indigenous people who can provide input 
without feeling like they, they are restricted to say things, without feeling like they are perhaps not considered or heard. And that's why I feel like if we all work together, if we all come up with the different things that we're supposed to contribute, we will empower local businesses. We will empower all our institutions and we can do it. It's just a matter of talking and talking openly and talking together at once and then working towards that plan, right? So, the other thing that I, I this is oh, I'm point, point number two, by the way. Now I'm going on point number three. Ne? The one thing that is most important right now in our um, industry or where we are as human beings or in our history is that we need to manage expectations when it comes to oil and gas. We are not going to be private jet people in the next five or 10 years. I'm sorry, Ricardo, but you're not getting it soon, yeah? At least not if we are being integrous, right? It's not going to happen. When you derive a profit or you gain some sort of income, at least this is how I'm taught or how I was raised, you don't go and you spend your money on things that are not important. You plow back into the kitty, you know, the business, so that, like George said, you have assets. Our assets at this moment is our data, ensuring that we understand what it is that we're sitting on. Number two, our people. Our people are our greatest asset. We need to invest back into them through education, through infrastructure, through our ports, all of that, it all takes people. And that is why this platform is an important platform. We can't have platforms where we are exclusionary of the local people, where they can't even access it. Okay, I'm dropping bars, but let's move. Okay, there's so many things I wanted to say, but I just wanted to say that let us understand the information. Let us understand where we are right now. Let us understand um, what it is that we're doing. Let us come up with commandments, you know, like Norway did. Let's have some commandments that we should all, number one, understand, number two, adhere to, and number three, advocate for, so that everyone is empowered. You will recall, I think, um, Next, uh, next page. Oh, sorry, I had, I'm the one that was in control of that, sorry. So, I just want to sort of get back to day one, where you might recall in my convenience address, I paid homage to the individuals on whose shoulders we all stand here today. However, in conclusion, um, please allow me to pay tribute to a few people, right? Number one, please allow me to pay tribute to the one person who was the very first person that shaped me, shaped who I am today. I met him for the very first time when I was four years old. He made such an impression on me. He always said to me, people are your wealth. And to Uyambawe. And it has always been the theme of my life. I obviously didn't understand it then and perhaps I still don't have full grasp of it. But this week I truly got to see it firsthand. His name was, his name is, and his name will always be Bernard Christoph Indongo, the late Oben, as he was affectionately known by those who hail from Onjaba. He was the love of my life and I miss him dearly, and I wish that he was here. 
So his legacy lives on through this inaugural conference because we are Namibia's wealth, all of us. I want to thank our partners, our sponsors, uh, and our exhibitors, and all of you who came here today so that we could all be in one location. You know, the, the number 300, I mean, we put it up there because I was just like, oh, okay, that's the capacity that the building can take. But we actually exceeded that number. George will tell you, like two or three weeks ago, the numbers were not looking like 300. Trust. They were not looking like 300, but we exceeded that. I think we had like 380 delegates in here, including, <laughs> including the 100 kids, the children, the Buchter babies that were here. Ah. The speakers were obviously more than 15, and we had master classes that were amazing. I'm so proud of the content that my speakers and my moderators and everybody had brought to this. You know, I think we set a precedence of excellence and I'm so proud. I'm so proud for everyone and every, anybody who came to pour in and give contribution, whether it was monetary or not. You lend your ear, you lend me your time, you lend us your vision of what Namibia should look like. And it was all on potential. It was all on potential. So we had to honor you. We had to show you the respect. We had to be here and be attentive to you and make sure that the quality is of international standard. Once you see potential, it should be met, you know? Once someone sees potential in you, it should be respected. And I'd like to thank each one of you. And I respect you and I thank you for being here. But also, in order for platforms like this to remain inclusive and accessible to all people, we do need corporate Namibia to come and be our backbone. We can't charge people more than what we're currently charging now. I'm sorry. Yesterday, somebody asked how many locals are here. It was only those who could afford to be here that were here. I wanted to make it free, but obviously it's not realistic. I can't make it free. I need corporate Namibia. We need corporate Namibia. NCCI, I mean, you've been tremendously helpful. You've been tr my partner throughout all of this, and I'm so, so grateful for lending me that endorsement that you did. But it's not just NCCI's responsibility to ensure SME development in this country. It's all of us. MTC, my first employer, is a part of who I am. Hmm? Old Mutual. They were the first ones to lend us their ear and they gave us their money. All of this, all of this is not possible without you. I'd obviously like to thank my advisory board members who have been very instrumental in bringing all of this together the industry, um, I don't want to say history or experiences, but their wealth of knowledge is actually what made sure that the content that we put out was of excellence today. The standard, we had risk analysis and all sorts of things leading up to this conference, but they played a huge role. I'd also like to thank my CEO at Rhino Resources, my big boss, as I'd like to call him, Mr. Travis Smithard, for all the support and encouragement that he's given me during this period. If we make a discovery, we go and party here next year, okay? Next year. The last people that I'd like to thank are obviously all the women in my life who've prayed for me, who've made made me who I am, who have been the beacons of inspiration to me throughout my life. But there are two women in particular that I'd like to thank for making this a reality. People from my core team, but most especially, Ms. Jamila Jacobs and Mrs. Rosetta Pisahi. Those two women. I thank them, I thank them every day. 
So, I mean, I could wrap all day, but we clearly have to wrap this up. 2025, will you be here? Will you come again? Okay. Will you come to Ludritz again? Because I'm not changing this conference to go anywhere else. You all have to come here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, apparently there's one more person I didn't thank. I'd like to thank Mr. Ricardo, our MC. You did such a stellar job. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. I was going to come thank myself, though. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Maria, and the team for that. Uh, I really wanted to call up the Jamila and her team, but they're still busy downstairs trying to set up and sort out uh, the bribe for us there as well. I know Chirongo is one that has also been running around here. You saw he, he looks like a, a bushman, that one. But the, yeah, he's here. They, oh, he's here in the house. Stand quickly, Chirongo, so that people can see who you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've been dealing with him. As we close off, I think in my parting words, I really just want to draw inspiration from Article 100 of the Namibian Constitution that talks about the ownership of the natural resources that they belong to the people of Namibia, those that are in the ground on top of the soil, in our continental shelf, in our exclusive economic zone when it comes to the sea, unless otherwise privately owned, it belongs to Namibians. And I think... That's what this conference is all about, making sure that that participation is secured. Like many said, it has been done before. When Africans come to the party, it's always a thing of, no, but this thing, it's corruption, etc., etc. But it has been done already before by many others, and it's working, and we can do it. On that note, thank you so much once again for making time out to be here. I'd like to invite you for that uh, seafood bride down there at the restaurant. Free for everybody, of course, courtesy of Seaflower, who's also one of the partners of the conference. Thank you so much, and have yourself a safe journey back. Bye-bye.